but um, uh, but it did tell it in in the whole grain. So for a 45,000 ton year, we finished early June or mid June. Uh, that moisture didn't drop the whole time. I think it averaged 20 and a half percent for the whole harvest. But the whole grain did tell, and those figures on the left hand side, um, you know, 70 ones for medium grain is about as good as you can get. Uh, and 75 for the the short grain um, is is again about as good as you can get. So pretty well that's 100% whole grain um, coming into the mill. Um, for the mill to have that sort of quality, particularly in a year where we've only got 45,000 tonne is great. So all credit to um, to the management of those crops and, and all involved with that. Um, Oh, it, being a, a, the year it was, so 45,000 tonne, as I say, around 14,000 tonne was, um, you're right, Charlie, that next slide's fine. 40, about 14,000 tonne was uh, down in the Murray. Um, so I won't sort of talk about individual crops or individual yield as much, except to say it was a fairly tough year, uh, and the Murray in particular, probably more so than the Murrumbidgee, given, um, obviously given further south, but the temperatures did affect the Murray more so. Um, there were some really good results of, of all varieties, um, particularly Opus Rizik and Viand. Um, and I've got to say, some really, most of it was on boil water down there. And um, at the start of the season, I did sort of think, given the quality of a few of the individual boards and the flow rate particularly that they had, um, that I was a bit worried about where the management of this crop was going to go and full credit to, uh, they were some of the best results. So absolute hats off to the management of those crops. Um, uh, it's a yeah, credit to you. Um, I, I just wanted to put this graph up just to display what uh, what happened this year. It was actually an above average heat year or, or degree day year. Um, however, there was a huge diurnal range this year. So the difference between the maximum and the minimum temperatures were significantly greater than certainly the last five years. So. The average, the minimums were above minimum, uh, but the maximums were were um, above. So the maximums were above maximum, but also the minimums were below minimum, um, and that told a lot for uh, the variability within crop um, and the delay in in PI date, and which Brian will touch on a bit later on. Um, and also some of the yield effects. So this is Denny um, as a, as uh, the temperature data for that. If you take 15 degrees, that, that line at the bottom there um, as being the, the critical value at early pollen microspore, you can see right throughout January and particularly into February that um, there were plenty of temperatures that, that hit below 15. Um, towards the end of February, there some of the very late crops that came in uh, got hit both at PI and at flowering and those temperatures at the end of Feb were down to you know sixes and sevens. So, um, and uh, and with relatively well, quite devastating results for those few individual crops. Where things were planted, uh, it wasn't a year to push any boundaries at all, uh, particularly in planting date and nitrogen management. Um, but planting date particularly and, and PI and by default where pollen microspore um, were, came into or the timing of that pollen microspore. So, um, there were plenty of crops that looked a lot better than, than they yielded. We did get plenty of 10s and 11s, but, um, but there were crops that yielded 8s and 9s that looked like you know 11s and 12s. So, and uh, it was pretty well down to cold. I don't know if we could have changed anything from management or timing. Um, unfortunately, it was just one of those years because weed control and establishment for, for most of the crops were, were pretty fantastic. Um, just uh, on that next slide, as I say, the, um, the yields for this year was a bit hard to, to pick individual crops just because there were so few of them, I didn't want to personalise it too much. So if, if we go back though, and being you know, a 14,000 tonne year, there's only so much you can, you can read off it, 14,000 tonne of Murray. So I'll, I'll go back to the five year average. So this is, um, this is overall about a 2 million tonne sample. Um, looking at the last five years. And what I wanted to point out here, regardless of the region and, uh, and the variety, the difference between what we average for that year, for that variety, and, uh, and what the top 20% of producers are getting is around two to two and a half tonne difference. 
So I just wanted to highlight what these varieties are capable of regardless of the year um, and, uh, and what happens very consistently every season for every variety. Um, so that two to two and a half tonne difference, if you put that into sums, and for those next slide, it's, um, it just puts us into a whole different water market. And uh, if you could just click on the next one, please, Charlie. That, so if you look at particularly Rosique and Marmidji Valley, just taking as an example, um, there's two and a half tonne difference there, depending on what your figures are. Of course, you're roughly an extra $100 a meg return, or an extra, you know, approximately $1,200 a hectare cream on the cake. Now, the big point here that that doesn't use any more water. Whether you get 12 and a half tonne or 15 tonne or five tonne, that paddock will use that amount of water regardless. So, um, uh, Russell will be talking towards the end about a transformational change that we're addressing or looking to address within the industry. Um, the genetics of these varieties haven't, or the genetic potential of these varieties certainly haven't been reached as an industry average. and. Um, uh, and we know we can do it because there are individuals or there are a fifth of our industry already doing it. So, um, yeah, it's just a matter of, of uh, addressing that and how exactly we can do that and, and, um, and, and you know, putting all those ducks in a row to, uh, to push that yield towards that higher end. Just um, the next slide, just the key learnings for this year, as I said, it certainly wasn't a year to push boundaries. Um, we probably learnt more from this year than we have the previous five years, simply because we could get away with a lot in the previous five years. Temperatures uh, were good, weather was, was fairly kind to us the majority of times. Um, and, uh, and as I say, we got away with a fair bit as far as, as plant populations, as far as planting time and um, um, and nitrogen management was concerned. Didn't happen this year. And, uh, and there were areas where once we got outside a window, um, we fell off a cliff. So, the, um, so timing was everything. Um, the overall though, we, I don't think we spend, or my personal side of things, the, the interaction um, between various uh, um, stages of the crop. So particularly looking at plant population, looking at that timing of sowing and the sowing method, and then how that interacts with your irrigation management and your nitrogen management. So the whole idea obviously is we want to optimise that vegetative uh, phase, but we particularly want to optimise the timing of that reproductive phase. And, uh, and that was our big limiting factor this year, and uh, is probably more so than we give it credit for in, in the majority of years. So, it's essentially following that recipe, which, which um, both Brian and, and, uh, and Troy will touch on a bit later on, to, um, to optimise that yield and, and push, push us all towards that, uh, that top 20%. 20%. Um, just, just as a, a final slide, um, for me, I just wanted to touch on, there's a heap of, of um, information on this next one, Charlie. Uh, it is being recorded, so read it at your leisure. Um, what I wanted to, to do, Opus isn't in the mix for the pool this year as yet. And uh, we've had a fair bit of feedback on that. Um, what I, and I'll, I'll, we'll discuss that in a little while, but basically what I, um, I wanted to bring up was where Opus and Razik and Sherpa uh, have performed or how they've performed in the Western Murray Valley um, between the years of 2013 and 2018. So obviously 2019 and 20 were very small years. Um, with a few individual crops, so, so I looked at uh, where the volume was. So just for your interest more than anything, I've put what the volume of total tonnes were for those regions, uh, for those varieties, what that average yield was. Um, a low and a high, which, you know, take that as, as it is, um, but, and where that top 20% hit. So if we look at um, uh, the 2014 year for Opus, for example, there was 60,000 tonne grown. Um, within that top 20% sample, we're looking at um, whatever that is, 12,000 tonnes. So, so they're significant samples. Um, and again, we're looking at that sort of two tonne difference between the average and the top 20%. Um, but what I was looking to do here is compare Opus, Rizik and Sherpa. Um, particularly in the Western Murray, there is a big emphasis on Opus and, and, uh, and, and Sherpa. 
And, uh, and dare I say, probably a bit of a bias against Rizik. And um, if you look at both the tons of Rizik that have been produced, which, which uh, interestingly is, is more than the other two, but also um, um, the, how it's performed uh, year in, year out, both low and high yield, the average yield and, and where that top 20% can, can sit. Uh, it's you know, very much a, uh, a competitive variety or, or, or an up there variety from yield and, and profit, profit, <laughs> profitability. So in saying that, and, uh, and I say we'll probably touch on a bit later on, but um, where will Opus sit this year? Um, so there's two, two answers to that. One, the market for Opus is essentially in the food service industry, both in Australia and Japan. Um, the food service industry was, was going berserk, particularly in Japan, and leading up to the Olympics was, uh, was really hitting the straps. Um, and we couldn't supply that market in the last two years, so, or hadn't been able to supply it to any volume. So it did put us at a disadvantage for a start, and then COVID hit, and, um, and essentially it's it shut down on us. So there isn't a market there for it. Um, similarly, in Australia, a lot of it went to the sushi market, which was a, a hugely growing um, food service industry. And, uh, and again, that's quietened right off and pretty well because of COVID. Um, in saying that, once we hit a critical volume of, of, uh, of other grains, and particularly Rizik, within, uh, within the south or within any area, but that then changes where the milling program sits uh, and how those overheads are distributed across the pool and uh, and can bring bring uh, APIS then into that sort of profitable uh, or high return market. So, um, so there is potential for APIS to be in the pool, but um, but uh, you know I guess at the moment don't hold your breath. And um, if you do have a seed order for Rizik or Sherpa, um, there is potential to be able to change that at, at that time. So, but there will be limited volumes uh, if it occurs at all. So that's, um, that's sort of where it stands, I suppose. And the final comment on that is, is um, our, we had a full seed program last year. So we had enough seed last year to produce around 800,000 tonne uh, paddy crop. Any seed that we don't use this year will go into the mill. Uh, we will run out of Australian rice early in the new year or, or sometime in the new year, so before the next harvest. So any of our seed reserve will go into the mill um, to try and bridge that gap. So we will have a full seed program again this year. And within that full seed program, Opus is again in the mix in its, in its, um, its usual percentage. So, uh, so hopefully this is a once off Opus and in the longer term, we, um, we are certainly looking to Opus to be, to be up there uh, at the volumes that it's been previously. So. Um, now, any, uh, any comments or queries on that? Uh, as I say, please feel free to, to give us a yell. All right. I'll take it from there and we'll... Okay, good on you. I'll hand you over to Anna and um, yeah, we'll talk soon. Okay. Um, all right, we'll jump on to the next one. Thanks, Charlie. Um, so, row rice is um, available again this season and we've had a lot of interest in it um, as it's a great way for growers to return um, to rice who have been out of the rotation and payment cycle for the past couple of seasons. Um, so Grow Rice will provide input funding to growers for all rice crop inputs, including water. Um, Sun Sunrise underwrites the facility, so the risk to the lending corporation is minimal. Hence the competitive interest rate that we can offer, which is around 2% per annum. Um, so for girls who grew last in 2018, they can access up to $1,500 a hectare prior to sowing for water and um, post-establishment for all other crop inputs. For girls who grew in C19 and C20 over the last two years, they can access up to $2,000 a hectare prior to sowing for water and post-establishment for all other rice crop inputs. Um, all other growers um, who, who haven't supplied in the last three years have the option of accessing up to $1,500 a hectare post-establishment for all crop inputs. So that just requires a quick crop inspection um, 
post establishment. Um, so grow rice funds will be deducted from the growers first payment, uh, whether that be a contract or pool payment. And um, it's a very simple online application. It takes about three working days um, for the facility to be approved and the funds to become available. So if anyone um, needs further information on that, please reach out to Mark or myself um, or anyone else at Girl Services and we'll be happy to help you through the application and the access of that. Um, thanks, Charlie. Yep. So seed orders um, opened for all growers yesterday and we've seen a fair bit of traffic on that front so far, which is great. Um, just goes to show the positivity among the grower base um, for the season ahead. So seed orders will all need to be placed through the GIS portal. It's a fairly simple process if all your paddocks are mapped accurately. Um, it's a good idea to check your paddock areas uh, prior to ordering seed, particularly if you have um, a contract that is based on hectares with only a small hectare tolerance um, on it. So they were the first round of contracts that we offered. Um, so once you're in the grower portal, into the GIS, and you're confident that your paddocks are mapped accurately, this will be the, the screen that you see. It's just a matter of click, clicking on the seed order button, choosing your farm from the drop down list um, that you want to order the seed for, and then either choosing add pool for any pool commitments that you want to make, or ordering against your existing contract, which will already be in the system there, and you'll see that um, lined up under your farm there. Um, and then you click, click on your selected paddock that you want to put the rice in um, and fill in the form with the variety, the issue depot, um, the sowing rate, follow on to the second page for the payment methods and um, insurance, etc. So um, our girls portal is also, oh, just click on one more please. Um, girls portal has also been under some construction over the last uh, six months, which has meant all growers login details have been reset. Um, girls will need to reset their password as per the instructions that were emailed to everyone individually around the 18th of August. Um, and follow those instructions step by step to reset their password and access the, the GIS again. Um, so those details that were emailed out are personal and relevant to each unique grower with a unique password and login ID in there. If you've missed both those, just let us know and we'll get it ready then. Um, so I'd encourage all growers who are interested in securing a limited availability variety. So we've got Sherpa, um, and potentially the option of some opus being available later on. Definitely follow those instructions really carefully, reset their passwords and access the Grow portal so that they can submit their seed order whenever, um, whenever the variety is available or submit their share for seed order now. Um, next one, Charlie, thanks. So pricing, as you'd be aware, there were some early contracts available for Rizik, Koshi and Dungara with Rizik at $4.75 and Koshi at $625 a tonne. These contracts were really well supported by growers, which was very encouraging um, and great to see the confidence in the season ahead. Um, so that resulted in Koshi being um, fully subscribed and the amount of Rizik at $4.75 also being fully subscribed. So we've since then seen had an indicative pool range released for this season, which is quoted at $390 to $450 a tonne for Rizik and Vian, and a $20 a tonne discount for Sherpa. Uh, so again, just on variety, it's, there's a limited amount of Sherpa available this season. The only delivery depot for Sherpa will be Denilipin, as this will be the most cost effective um, site for a small volume um, across the Murray Valley. I suggest that if you are interested in growing Sherpa that you place your seed order as soon as possible while the stocks are available. Um, we will take as much Rizik and Viand as you're willing to grow and have planned receival sites at um, Baraboy, Finley and Deniliquin for those varieties. Again, as we move closer through the sowing window and as the company gets a better understanding of the potential crop size, 
Um, we may see a shift in the number of depots open or even the varieties on offer. But yeah, as we've said, unfortunately, Sage Opus isn't in the mix um, due to the impacts that coronavirus has had on the food services market, um, and which is its primary destination. And we also need to get a greater clarity around the dinner liquid milling program. Um, so this situation will be monitored very closely by the board and adjusted if needed. But the promising thing is, as the crop potential grows and as more commitments are made to the pool, the greater the chance that a critical level will be reached and the possibility of a very limited amount of opus will become available. Um, yeah, but I must stress, uh, uh, if it, uh, opus does become available, it will be limited and the delivery site will be deniliquin, so that must be factored in. Um, at this stage, at this stage, the range of varieties on offers reflects the highest returning markets and ultimately maximising the returns to Riverina growers through the pool. Um, I've also fielded a few questions about the availability of pool one, particularly for Rizik. And my understanding is that there is plenty of space in the pool for Rizik and Viand and our limited volume of Sherpa at this stage. However, um, the board has given their best indication based on a range of scenarios. And for now, the best estimate available for a crop growing in size by the day. Um, one other note on varieties while we're here. Um, Koshi, I see there's both some established and new growers who have signed up for this variety. Um, which is good to see. And I just wanted to make note that yes, while the potential of this variety is really, really high and rewarding at times. Um, the potential to become unstuck is also very high and somehow there seems to be not that much in between some years. So just be very aware of the um, management of this variety, particularly with the timing of sowing, nitrogen management, uh, water management, especially leading up to um, through the uh, vegetative growth stage through PI. Um, and be very, very familiar with the growing guides for Koshi and understand there is a bit of a trade-off between yield, quality and harvestability when it comes to nitrogen management. Um, we'll just go to the next one, Charlie. Um, on the pool this year too, you may have noticed, and I just want to make everyone aware there is a washout clause associated with the pool this season. So with the contracts, the washout was clause um, came into effect if you did not deliver 75% of the long-term average for that variety for the region. Um, and it, that was priced at $150 a tonne. For the pool, the washout is less than the fixed price contract. Um, and it reflects the risk sharing nature of the pool. So the washout will come into effect if you do not deliver 50% of the long-term average of your variety for your region. So if you look at Rizik for the Western Murray Valley, the long-term average is 10.25 tonnes per hectare. So if you produce 5.21 tonnes per hectare, so you have to produce 5.12 tonnes per hectare. Um, if you only produce 4.1 tonnes per hectare, you will have to pay $50 a tonne or $50 a hectare for the shortfall in your commitment. Um, the clause is generally very conservative, um, but the reason it came into effect, particularly this year, is that um, it's really, a, we're asking for your commitment to plant when you place your seed order. It's aiming to reduce the impacts and the cost of non-delivery on other pool participants, and it's, particularly the case this season, as the overall return, returns are very sensitive to a number of factors, including um, the total volume received, conversion overheads, and the particular variety mix that um, is grown. Um, one other thing to note, um, we have, there is a new variety that's been extensively trialled and bulked up for seed this season, which is currently called B071. It's a replete Rizik replacement and its yield potential is approximately 18% of 18% um, above Rizik and it has a greater cold tolerance than Rizik and a similar sowing window to Rizik. Um, there'll be around 300 hectares of that sown across the Riverina. Um, we're looking to extensively trial it under all conditions, sowing methods, regions, as we bulk it up to seed. 
So we look forward to sharing more about this variety um, and its progress with you as the season unfolds. Um, we can just jump to the receivable plan, have a quick look at that. Uh, this was available in the seed circular. Um, so as you can see, dinner opens available for Sherpa receipt beyond Koshi and potentially if any opus is available, that will also be um, destined for dinner open. Faraboy and Finley are also open for um, Rizik and Beyond at this stage. Um, so yeah, definitely worth being aware of that if um, if you are choosing a variety that you may have to haul it into Denny um, if that's not your local depot. Um, next one too, thanks Charlie. Um, so just to finalise, um, great to see so many growers returning to rice again this year. Fantastic to have a little bit of water in our accounts and to see the winter crop potential looking um, really good at this stage. Mark and I will be available to work with you throughout the season. So don't hesitate to give us a call or text if you need anything. My work days are Wednesday and Thursday and Mark is a workaholic and available all the time. Um, so yeah, please feel free to contact um, any any of us at Grower Services or any industry representatives as you require. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Anna. Um, there's just a question about, can we get an understanding why the cost of seed is so high this season? Um, yeah, sure. So seed prices have gone up this season because last year with a small crop and the um, price of $750 a tonne, that's the price the business was paying for its seed, as well as the additional on costs for grading and um, cleaning the seed and making that available. So it is it is a reflection on last year's high um, price for for growing the crop that we did have to pay growers to um, secure that. And we had a full seed program last year, so. Um, a lot of last year's crop did go towards seed um, so that we did have fresh seed stocks available for um, a potentially larger crop this year, which, um, yeah, as it's turning out. So, yeah, I hope that does help understand um, why the significant rise there is in seed. And just, just on that too, Charlie, the... Um so, yeah, as Anna said, seed is a reflection of the paddy price last year with, with on costs. Um, and if you look at seed, it was equal to $750 a tonne. Um, you know, once you grade that seed out, you're probably down to 75 to 80% grade out. Um, so every tonne you get 750 to 800 kilos of seed. Um, there's your $1,000 a tonne full on. So that's, um, yeah, so I guess it's, you know, it, it's, it's a lower cost than what it could have been, but it's, it's certainly significant. On that, there, there has been a fair few seed orders or, or a number of seed orders that have come through that are looking at uh, that 180 to 200 kilos to the hectare. Um, now, Brian will touch on this later on as far as plant population and seeding rates are concerned, but this year that extra 30 to 50 kilos is worth 30 to $50 a hectare to you, um, you know, which covers the cost of the plane pretty quick. So just, just be a, a little bit aware of that. Um, and uh, yeah, that thought coming in. I've just got um, just got a, a query here from Bruce, um, who uh, who's messaged me privately. I'm not sure if you meant to do that, Bruce, but if you did, sorry, that's now public. Um, saying, uh, what's the standout driver allowing growers to be in that top 20%? Uh, now, it's a great question. Um, there isn't a specific driver, unfortunately. There's not a specific silver bullet. Um, there. And, and invariably the top 20% just do everything right all the time. So their timing of their, their timing of all their operations, most people will say, how much nitrogen do the top 20% put on? Um, thinking that that's their main driver. Uh, and the answer I normally give is they put on the right amount for that crop, for that, uh, for that soil type. Um, so last year, the only thing we could measure in the top 20% just from a sample size was Rizik and the MIA. And all crops, so there was only about a dozen crops in that. Um, they had a range of sowing methods, a range of irrigation management, and a range of nitrogen rates. Um, what they all had in common last year is 
their nitrogen weights were certainly not over the top. Um, they were not, you know, either more or less than anybody else. Um, but they all hit PI within that first two weeks of January. Um, and regardless of the sowing date, that's where they hit PI. So uh, that was certainly the, the common denominator last year. Um, and usually also the top 20% of crops rarely fall over. Um, so that nitrogen management is more spot on rather than being uh, either excessive or underdone. So just, um, yeah, a bit of a, a query on that. Yeah, and I see we've just got a question as well from Robert um, saying, why isn't Moolamine shed open for paddy um, this season? Um, I guess, Robert, at the moment, the harvest receival plan is, is the best indication that the board's provided based on a, on a number of scenarios. Um, it is an indicative harvest receival plan, so things potentially could change if, um, if there is a significant amount of um, paddy growing up around Moolamine. Um, which, yeah, it looks like yeah, there definitely potentially could be. Um, it could be a me moving feast, so we will advise you as soon as possible if, um, if anything can be changed. But, yeah, unfortunately at this stage, um, Baraboy has been the nominated shed, nominated by, um, by the board and, and that for, um, yeah, based on the current scenario and, and the season they're forecasting. And I think that's important, Robert. The, um, you know, things potentially can change in that respect, but making your decision today, just um, make it on the fact that you will probably be carting it to the ones that are open. And if others open, then that's a bonus. But um, yeah, hopefully, which hopefully that happens. But, uh, but if it doesn't, that you've prepared and budgeted for carting it to the closest depot that was open at the time. Thanks, Mark and Anna. Oh, sorry. Asked, um, can we, yeah, discuss seed on his comment. So Bruce has asked, uh, I don't think growers should be subsidising seed growers from last year. The price should be based on a rolling average. Um, good question, Bruce. Um, Mark, have you got any more comments around that? I know yeah, five-year average was, was discussed. Yeah, that was actually flagged um, at the board level. I'd probably have to uh, hand you over to board members to, to give you more of a, an indication of that. But um, whether that's where they'll go going forward, it's, uh, yeah, but it's, it's probably not a bad idea to bring out those highs and lows of a, of a variable crop. And our uh, Mark, uh, just when would seed be available in the Murray Valley? Uh, good question. I, um, I think pretty well the depots are gonna be open beginning of October. Um, if anyone wants anything earlier, uh, just um, give us a yell, but I think they're organising themselves to be open the beginning of October. Alrighty, we might move on. Thanks, Anna and Mark. If you do have any other questions for them, please reach out and get in contact with them. So I'm now going to hand over to Brian Dunn from the New South Wales DPI. Brian's going to run us through some changes to the variety guides that have been made ready for the C21 season. So all yours, Brian. Thanks, Carlton. Uh, morning, everybody. Great to see a good turn up. Um, looking forward to a much better year than the last couple of years. And it's um, quite exciting to see a number of people interested in growing rice again. I'm just going to go through some of the agronomy um, issues or topics, I guess. A lot of things that Mark touched on and are going to the more detail, uh, particularly sowing dates, plant population, talk about establishment, a fair bit on nitrogen, particularly on the different varieties, and um, where to access some of the information as well. If you haven't seen our new growing guides, we've updated the growing guide, so we have a growing guide for every variety. And this diagram here is is out of the RISIC growing guide. So we have one of these diagrams for every variety. And the idea of it is to show you why we have the sowing window where we do. We look across the green, that's your ideal time for your crop to come into PI. And then we move across to the right, we've got the microspore and flowering periods. So sowing dates are pretty much based on getting the crop to um, be at the different development stages at these times. And the reason behind that is the hatched area, which is the time of least risk of low temperatures. 
you um, if you start to push your crop late, you'll start to push microspores not too bad because it's still in a fairly good window. And microspore can be protected by deep water. But flowering, you're pushing flowering into late February where we do get a lot of cold temperatures and there's no potential for protection from deep water and you're really increasing your risk. A lot of seasons on late sown crops, we do see two or three tonne of yield decline from flowering cold, which um, people often don't recognise. So we come back to the left and we're looking at um, the sowing dates for RISIC. So you can see the window here for aerial sowing is um, end of October, early November. As we come back to drill sowing, it's like 10 days earlier and delay permanent water is 10 days earlier than that. So the basis behind this is the rice, the, the um, longer period it's ponded, the shorter it's growing period. So when we go from aerial sowing or dry broadcast to drill, it's normally ponded for a month less and that extends the, the growing period of the crop. And then we're going to delay permanent water, we reduce the period of ponding for another month and that's pushing the um, sowing window even earlier. But probably the most important thing from this is if, you, um, if you're if you sowing at all late, you, you really, but we don't recommend you sow late at all because basically um, you're really increasing your risk of cold damage. And um, But if you do end up sowing late, the last thing you want to do is actually add delayed permanent water to that because you're going to even delay the crop further. So this is a VN, so there could be a fair bit of VN growing this year. So you can see the windows are a fair bit later. We don't have a recommendation here for VN for aerial sowing. So VN does grow really well aerial sowing, but it is more susceptible to a lodging, particularly as you start to push high yields. VN had its tendency to lodge. And we have found from our research and a lot of um, commercial crops as well, that the tendency to lodge is higher in an aerial sowing crop than a drill sowing crop. I'd really like to, if you are using VN, so a good opportunity this year, there's probably be a fair few people who have planted winter crops, not knowing how much water they'll get, and they might be going to cut those for hay or do something with them and convert them into a rice crop. And some of the opportunities probably will be VN. So if you're pushing late, you really want to get your water on as early as you can. You don't want to be using delayed permanent water if you're already outside that sowing window. I've done a fair bit of work uh, um, in a project with plant population. John Fowler was involved in this project and we had a lot of experiments in the Murray Valley. From that we found that between 40 and 400 plants a square metre we really had no difference in grain yield. So rice is really adaptable to changing plant populations. When you get a low plant population it produces more tillers per plant, but it also produces longer panicles. So you have more grains per panicle, which, which is how it makes up for, um, for that low plant populations. But our recommendation is for 100 to 200 plants a square metre, because there's no advantage in going higher than that. And in some cases we've found with some varieties in some situations, actually the high plant populations increase lodging which is what we want to stay away from as well. So aim for 100 to 200 plants a square metre. Row spacing, we did a fair bit of work on drill sowing with row spacings and we found no difference in grain yield between 18 and 27 centimetres. Once we got past 27 centimetres, when you got a missing plants in a row, the neighbouring plants could no longer make up, the gap was too large, so they couldn't make up the yield, so you got the yield decline. So really the ideal range probably for row spacing, I would think is 18 to 25 centimetres. So we then take that to the next step and look at sowing rates. So these are the current recommendations for sowing rates for all our varieties. You can see RISIC there. They're pretty much based on grain size. So RISIC is a bold grain, a larger grain. So there's a lot less grains in a kilogram than what there is for a short grain like Opus or Dungara. So you'll find there'll be the same amount of grains per hectare at those different sowing rates. And at these sowing rates, really, they're very conservative rates. So we always find, if we sow at these rates, we always get up, you know, up around the 200 or more plants a square metre. We see no reason why anyone would, in any circumstances, need to go higher than these rates. And in some cases, particularly where people have um, 
got a good history of drill sewing, really good equipment, so good layouts and then really good equipment when they get a good consistent depth, we often find they could reduce these rates by 25% and still get up towards 200 plants a square metre. But maybe in a year like this when, um, as you've been discussing, seed costs are really high, that's another reason not to be um, looking at high, high sowing rates. We did a fair bit of work on seedling vigour. Um, so we did the stuff in the field here where Tina's planting seeds in a row, but she also did a fair bit of work on slant boards in constant temperature rooms. And we found that Rizik and Vian are both larger seeds and both have the highest seed seedling vigour. In our experiments in the field, we all, always find that Rizik is the first variety to emerge. You can be walking through the plots and you go, oh, what's that plot? First one out is always Rizik. Most of our other varieties are all fairly similar in the, in the middle there, reasonable. Apart from topaz, which you don't have to worry about down south, um, it's a real slug, it's terrible. So, But Rizik um, is our best variety for seedling vigour. In the plant population work we did, um, we looked a lot at the percentage of seeds that became established plants. And we found no real difference between drill sowing. So the average across all the experiments over the three years was 48% of seeds became established plants for drill sowing. Aerial sowing, when we had pre-germinated seed, was 45%, so really no difference to the drill. But if we applied um, <coughs> excuse me, dry seed to the soil surface and then put permanent water straight on, we had an average of 21%. And you can see that in the photo on the right there, the plot in the middle here with these red tags, there's very few plants and the headland around the outside. That's where we applied dry seed to the soil surface. And the two plots either side of that had pre-germinated seed. And so did the commercial field was pre-germinated. And what happens in many situations, if it's a little bit clotty or the soil's a bit sodic, you apply the seed to the soil surface, you flood it, and then a fair amount of soil covers the seed and the seed can no longer access oxygen for the germination process and will die. It doesn't matter what seed rate you put on, um, as you can see by the photo, it's going to be a disaster. So we would not recommend that practice at all. Dry broadcasting growers are quite proficient at this and how they get away with this is, is they'll, they'll spread it, they'll give it a flush irrigation and they'll let the soil dry out which allows the seed to get oxygen and then they'll go to permanent water after that and that's quite a successful method of, of establishment. Drill sowing, some of you will have used drill sowing down south, there's a few people that consistently use it and get good results and others that might be a little bit, bit newer. Probably the major issue with drill sowing is, is field layout. Really you've, you've got to have paddocks that are uh, not too flat and don't have any low lying holes where the water can't get off. Particularly that second flush is critical. The first flush is important because if you have water laying there for a couple of days, it fills up the soil profile with moisture. And then when you do the second flush, there's no internal um, soil drainage of water. But the second flush, ideally you'd like to have the water on and off that field or bay within 12 hours. I know that's not always um, possible, but that's what you sort of aim for. 18 hours I'd consider a maximum. And if you don't do that, it's not a matter of, um, I will sow more seed to account for that, because if you don't get that, as in the picture, you don't get any plants. So where the water ponds, particularly on that second flush, you can get really um, non-existent establishment. With really good equipment now, good um, drills, you can get accurate seed depth to, um, and we recommend around three centimetres for most soils. If you've got a, a soil that crusts really badly, you might have to go to five centimetres so you can get the seed below the crust so it doesn't dry out between, between that first and second flush. By getting a good three centimetres, what it does is you, um, it allows you the time, the, so the seeds down there in the moisture, it allows time, so the second flush is normally timed just before uh, the plant emerges. So that gives you the opportunity to get Malcolm's Magic three-way mix on which is critical for drill sowing. That three-way mix, as he will talk about, um, sets you up for a, a really good crop for weed control. And then the second flush, will the plants will pop through on that and, um, and you'll be on your way. 
We do have a, a prime fact on drill sowing, which I'll talk about later, which if you haven't drill sown or you haven't done for a couple of years, I'd recommend you have a read. There could be a few points there just to um, pick up on again. And if you get, if you're drill sown and um, you're trying to save a bit more water and you've got weeds under control, delayed permanent water is a good option. With um, drill sowing and delayed permanent water, it's even more critical for delayed permanent water, but because it's um, not pond, it's aerobic for a much greater period, we really recommend you sow phosphorus and zinc with the seed. So granulock Z is ideal fertilizer because there's zinc in every granule. It's really best sown with the seed because that way the seed needs it when it's germinating and establishing. It's right there with the seed, it picks it up straight away. Zinc particularly, you don't, it's not always necessary, but it's, um, we've found it in research where it's a cut area or a high pH area and there's carbonates in the soil. The crop will normally establish in those areas, but then when you go to permanent water, if it's low in zinc, the plant will die when it goes anaerobic. And um, we've seen that in a few experiments, it's been an absolute standout. So zinc's not very expensive. If you drill sowing, I'd highly recommend so with the seed. I wouldn't moisture stress the crop excessively between flushes um, with delayed permanent water, because it does, if you start to stress it too much, it extends the growth period as well, slows the crop's growth. And once you start to get a reasonable canopy cover in the crop, you're not really saving much water because all you're doing is sucking the moisture out of the soil, which you then have to refill. There's not a lot of advantages there. I would recommend not going to lay permanent water too late, like really before Christmas, ideal timing. As I said before, if you've late sown a crop, do not use to lay permanent water because it will make it even later and it push it in those critical colder temperatures during um, microspore, but particularly flowering. So I'm going to go through nitrogen now. So probably the best practice for nitrogen, or not probably, it is the best practice if you're aerial or dry broadcasting. The most efficient way of get, putting your fertiliser on your nitrogen is drilling it into the soil, 10 to cent, 7 to 10 centimetres deep, close to the time of permanent water, pre-permanent water. If you drill or delay permanent water, applying it to the dry soil surface. So the critical thing here is the dry soil. So it goes in with the water after the flush irrigations and, and close to permanent water. So the worst practice and what gives you the highest losses of nitrogen is when you're putting it into spreading the urea into the water when there's no plants or small plants like is in the picture. Because what happens is the fertilizer, the urea goes into the water, it dissolves and then it's lost through volatilization. It can't go into the soil because the water's already saturated. The so soil saturated with water, there's no movement into the soil. So you could easily lose 60 or 70% of your nitrogen in that situation. And it's a bit the same with drill sowing. If you're applying nitrogen to wet soil and then you're, you're putting water on it, permanent water, normally if it's dry, the water will dissolve the area and it will go in with the water in and attach to the clay particles in the soil. But if the soil's already wet, the water doesn't go in there. So a lot of the nitrogen stays in the free water on the surface and gets lost through volatilization. And apart from the starter fertilizer at sowing, you really wouldn't be putting any other nitrogen on with your seed at sowing because it'll go through the, as it goes through the flushes, the wetting and drying cycles will go through nitrification, denitrification, and you'll get significant losses there as well. There is also a fair bit of difference between the sowing methods for nitrogen efficiency. So the best practice, so as I talked about for aerial and dry broadcast, drill it into the soil, you'll often get up to that 60%. Like poor practice, you might spread it on the surface, soil might be real dry. You might give it a cultivate, it might be a fair while before you go to permanent water. You might only get 40% efficiency. If you go to drill, normally you're looking at about 10% higher than that because at that time there are plants. The plants might be seven or 10 centimetres high. They've got roots. So they can take that urea up a lot quicker uh, after it's been applied than what you can with aerial, which it might have been sitting there for a month or more longer with opportunities for losses. But the same thing, if it's dry, soil's dry, onto, then you um, apply permanent water pretty much straight away, you can get up to 70%. Delayed permanent water, 
is more efficient again. And the reason for this is that because the plants are often like they are in the picture, they're quite well established. They've got an established root system. And we find that you apply your reed to the soil, dry soil surface, apply water, and a lot of that fertilizes in the plant in three or four days and it's very efficient. So probably if you're moving from aerial sowing with those sort of practices to, to a delayed permanent water practice, you need to be aware of the difference in efficiency and you might have to reduce your rates of nitrogen pre-permanent water by something like 25% to, to account for that. So in every growing guide, we have graphs like this for each variety. So this graph is RISIC, and this is the average. So RISIC, in our six years we've been doing this project, is 66 experiments which have contained RISIC. So these results are the average of the yields from those 66 experiments. Along the x-axis, we have the rate of pre-permanent water applied urea. And then the green line is the average grain yield across those rates. So you can see it increasing and then plateauing. And then the 10 and 90 percentile levels of grain yield. Now the important factor in this graph are the blue, the blue bars, which actually relate to lodging scores. So when you get a lodging score of 10, the crop's flat on the ground. Lodging score of zero, it's fully standing. So you can start to see as these are averages of 66 experiments. Some of these experiments will have had a lodging score of 10 up at the top here, and others will have had zero. But on average, you can see the general trend as we get into these really high pre-permanent water nitrogen rates we're starting to get increased lodging. I often get asked the question of how much urea should we put on pre-permanent water. So for drill and aerial dry broadcast, for our standard varieties, so Rusic, Sherpa and Opus, they're all semi-dwarf varieties. They all are, are, are very similar in many of their characteristics and they require a similar amount of nitrogen pre-permanent water. So it pretty much depends on the um, soil type and the paddock history. So from all of our experiments we've undertaken in the project, we've pretty much found that in a, there's very few legumes these days. So you know, I'm talking about only crop soils here. We always need 260 kgs urea, free permanent water to get up towards the, the yield we're after. If you find with your soils or that you're actually always having to put doing the tissue test and you're always needing to put on a fair bit of nitrogen pre-permanent water, or PI, sorry, you probably need to up that rate a bit. And if you're on some of the hungrier um, clay soils, heavy salt mulching clay soils, you might need to put on something like 390 kgs per hectare. So it's variable depending on soils and the history. What you're aiming to do is get PI nitrogen uptake in that 120 to 140 kg range. So if you tissue test consistently, you'll understand that PI nitrogen uptake level a lot better. Probably, um, there was a question earlier asked to Mark about um, what the growers do to get in that uh, top 20%. A lot of you often do get in the top 20%, but it's not all of your paddock. So probably one of the biggest factors going forward is ticking all the boxes consistently, but making sure you have no poor areas. And so you really need to address poor areas or they might be cut areas or areas that are consistently lower yielding with extra nitrogen pre-permanent water. So I'll discuss more about, um, about that later. It's really important that the paddock yields evenly. So if we look at the varieties, I talked there about Rizik, Sherpa and Opus in the red. So they'll all have similar pre-permanent water nitrogen re um, re requirements. Opus, the top end's a little bit lower, and the only reason for that is because higher rates will increase protein. And as we know, Opus is a short grain variety, made to sushi, and you don't want too high protein. If we look at the other varieties, Viand and Langi, we've come back a little bit on the recommendation. They're, they're both semi-dwarfs, but the recommendation is slightly lower. They still need a reasonable amount, but the top end has been brought back a bit. And the main reason for those for Viand is lodging. And there won't be many Langy growers down south, but occasionally some do. So Langy is lodging and cold. Koshiakara is a different, different beast. Koshiakara is a tall variety. It reacts totally different. It lodges really easily and management is so different. You need to apply much less urea pre water to Koshi if you're growing that. 
So here I've got the same graph, this is VN, so the same graph as I had before, so the same range of nitrogen rates, up to 520 kg the urea per hectare. So here you can see that it shadows, but yield is starting to decline at the highest rates. And also you can see the lodging is quite extreme. As we get up here to the really high nitrogen rates, pre-permanent water, the end has some really serious lodging. And so if you're growing the end, you really need to be aware of this and not overdo it up front. In the growing guys, we also have graphs like this, very variety showing the relationship between permanent water urea and yield compared to RISIC. So if you're, you know, a, a grower of RISIC, you can sort of look at this and see what the differences are and how you might actually modify your management of pre-permanent water nitrogen. Let's put this graph in because I thought it was quite um, useful to understand how much yield PI nitrogen can make up. So this is from our remote sensing experiments at Leeton Field Station last year. So it's a heavy self-mulching grade clay. It needs a lot of urea. So you can see we've pushed up here 650 kgs urea per hectare. The reason we're doing this is we're trying to build the algorithms for the remote sensing. So we need a range, a big range of nitrogen uptake. So we need really high nitrogen uptakes up to 250 and stuff. So you wouldn't recommend that in most commercial situations. If you go across, you can see here, we get to about 390 kgs per hectare of urea and yield plateaus. It doesn't increase after that. And when we get to the top rate, it starts to drop off. You can also see at that 390 kgs per hectare, there's no difference whether you applied PI nitrogen or you didn't. So the three lines, the zero is where we applied no PI nitrogen, so it's grain yield. The green is 130 kgs per hectare of urea PI, and that's 260. So the other important thing to note here is, is when we're down, down here, when we haven't applied enough pre-permanent water nitrogen, we can't make it all up by applying it at PI. So that's why I'm saying to, to get those higher yields, you need to have supplied enough nitrogen for the crop pre-permanent water. So the take home message from this graph is, um, yeah, nitrogen applied at PI cannot make up for large deficiencies in pre permanent water applied nitrogen. So this mightn't be a whole field, this might be just areas of your field which are bringing your whole yield down. Let's touch on Koshi for the growers that might be doing that, particularly any new growers. You really need to read these guides and talk to people who have grown Koshi before. It is a very different crop to grow and if you overdo it you'll be picking every bit up off the ground it's a tall variety it's a nightmare of a job so you can see here the lodging so here the your pre-permanent your pre-permanent water urea only goes up to 390 so it's less than we had in the other graphs but we're already already getting some serious lodging here at these sort of rates and the yield drops off so we consistently can get 10 ton per hectare out of koshi we don't do it by putting a lot of pre-permanent water urea on this graph's in the Koshi um, growing guide as well. I won't go into the detail of it, but it shows lodging score and also protein. If you look across here at the third last column, we're getting up near maximum yield with um, not that much lodging, and we're applying a third of the urea pre-permanent water and two thirds PI. So you really need to manage Koshi quite differently. So if you're gonna maximize grain yield, and get in that top 20%, you really need to reduce variability. So but what we've found the last uh, five years or so is people have particularly gone towards using spreaders on drill sowing and even sometimes on, on aerial sowing, put on with spreaders rather than your air seeder under the ground, which I highly recommend. Air seeders under the ground for, drill, for aerial sowing or dry broadcast. We're getting striping from the spreaders. So we're actually not, precision ag's all about reducing our variability. And the only way we'll get in that top 20% is to reduce our variability. If you're actually increasing your variability by using spreaders that aren't, um, well, one, they aren't calibrated, but if they're calibrated really well, if it's a windy day or different fuel sizes, you can still get striping. So just be really aware of that. Also that you need to address your pre-permanent water variability um, with that. Sorry, you need to address the variability with pre-permanent water fertiliser. As I said before, it's too late by PI. 
but there is an option for growers, which I, I would recommend. I, I'm not, I don't normally recommend mid-season trop dressing of rice because um, you, you don't need to do that for maximum yield. But if your field has a lot of variability in it, you can easily use the free NDVI imagery. There's lots of sources for that. So Sentinel, 10 metre, you NDVI imagery is fine. It's no good when you get to PI because it saturates out. But early December, so I'd recommend early December, if you have variability, you get some images of NDVI in that time, go and ground truth it, make sure it's not weeds or, or low establishment. And then maybe you could top dress some of those areas that are really underdone so that they're a reasonable growth by PI. As Mark said before, I was just gonna to touch on the PI last year. So for those grew, growers who grew last year, they'll, they'll understand that RISIC, the PI predictor didn't predict RISIC very well last year because it reacted quite differently. So this is just the average um, days from first flush to PI for RISIC for drill sown. And the average is 73 days. Last year was actually 80 days. So normally the PI predictor is based on day degrees, so the average minimum and maximum temperature. So you'd expect if it was eight, um, seven days delayed, it must have been a cold season. But as Mark said, it was actually a warm season last year. And the average temperature over that vegetative period was a degree warmer than normal. But when you look at the actual minimums and maximums, um, maximum was high, minimum was low, as Mark touched on. And RISIC is a variety, like varieties all react quite differently at times. And RISIC definitely, when you get these cold and minimum temperatures, RISIC slows its growth. So even though the average was, uh, was quite high, the minimums were low and RISIC slowed down and this wasn't picked up by the by the PI predictor. So you all should, when you apply for seed, we've talked with grower services and you should receive the growing guide for that seed. It should be sent to you at a, at a time that's um, hopefully useful. There's also, we do have all the growing guides are on the DPI website and they're also on the rice extension website. Now just be make sure you actually get the 2020 version there's still the 2018 version on, on some of the websites, which is um, 2020 is much better, a lot more updated information. And there's also the rice variety guide, which David Troll has compiled all of our, our growing guides into, into one document. And we also have a number of packages. If you haven't grown for a few years, we try and write these um, in a short, succinct so there's not too much rubbish to read straight to the point and we hope there's a number of points we get a number of people to read these and criticize them and we hope that they're quite useful so if you haven't grown rice for a couple of years i'd highly recommend you you have a look at our growing guide so plant population management drill zone rice and you can download those off the um new south wales dpi website as well so i guess in summary uh most important factors so the critical thing is, is consistent high yields. We can all get 13 or 14 or in some cases 15 tonne, but can you get 13 or 14 tonne every year, which is what we're aiming for? So on time is probably the major, the major things. Is that all it's on? So you get your microspore and flowering in the period of least cold risk. Adequate plant stand. You really, there's Rice, as I said, is really adaptable to different plant populations, but you want no bare holes because you're definitely use, losing yield. You must have enough nitrogen pre permanent water on your rice, but it varies with soil types and uh, variety. And address your field variability, pre permanent water. If you haven't got that right, look at mid season. And probably the most critical thing, the growers down south, you really are good with deep water, much better than the growers up north. And it is a, a really valuable tool um, for helping to protect against cold at microspore. But don't go too early with your deep water because it makes the plants grow too tall and it's not as beneficial. So I guess the bottom line is maximising yield from all parts of the field. So yeah, good luck. Thanks, Brian. Um, there is a quick question in the chat box. I'm not sure if you can see it, but there's a question about permanent water on aerial sown crops. And is there any new developments with mid-season draining? 
I'm not sure if John Fowler wants to comment on mid-season droning at all, but um, I think it's pretty much consistent. Like mid-season droning is particularly valuable for, for straighthead. I um, think it's also a good opportunity in that situation if you've got variability in your crop to apply a little bit of nitrogen before you put the water back on. So to those areas that are, are low in um, low in growth, it's a good opportunity there. But um, yeah, it's a pretty good, in a lot of the soils down there that are prone to straight head, it's quite a, a valuable um, a valuable tool. And yeah, you just gotta make sure you dry the soil out fairly well so it can get um, aerobic and get the oxygen back in it. Hope that helps. Thanks, Brian. Um, I was just going to check if John Fowler is online. Yeah, I'm here, can you hear me? Yep, did you have any comments you want to make about the mid-season draining? Uh, I think Brian's covered it pretty well. The only other comment I'd make is if you're going in the country that hasn't had rice for quite some time, the straight head risk can be increased, particularly if you're incorporating a fair bit of organic material uh, prior, to, prior to sowing. Um, so that just needs to be borne in mind. Apart from that, uh, um, I mean, there are varieties that are more sensitive to, to straight head than others, but uh, might, might not be much um, over around this, this year. But yeah, I think Brian's comments are pretty right. Cool. Thanks, John. Alrighty. I can't see any other questions. So if you do have something you want to ask Brian throughout the season, feel free to email him or give him a call. He's more than happy to answer any questions. So I'll move on. Our next speaker this morning is Connie Mort. She works for Corteva AgroSciences. And Connie's just going to give us a quick update about two new chemicals, which is Ajixa and Eubenic. So I will hand over to Connie to let her chat. Thanks, Charlton. Can you hear me okay? Yep, all good to go. Are you still there, Connie? Um, yep, can you hand over control? Uh, thanks for that, Charlton. Um, yeah, so as, as Charlton mentioned, two new products in rice. Um, Ubenic uh, has been out for a couple of seasons, but as um, there hasn't been a lot of rice around, it hasn't been used a lot. So I just wanted to provide a refresher on that one. Um, and the brand new um, herbicide, a jigsaw, will be ready for this season. Um, and it's a replacement for barnstorm herbicide. So Rinscore Active is the new active ingredient. Um, new mode of action that um, Corteva has developed um, and commercialised. Um, so in a GC, you've got Cyhalophop, which was part of Barnstorm, and it's also got the Rinscore Active component in there too. So two modes of actions uh, working on weeds. Um, and similar to Barnstorm, it's uh, applied as a post-emergence uh, foliar spray and can be used in aerial, dry broadcast and drill sown rice systems. Uh, Ubenig, on the other hand, is just a straight Rinscore Active product. Um, and it's applied by squirt uh, or bickley boom uh, um, application methods and, and needs to be applied directly into flood water. So therefore it's only really suitable for aerial or dry broadcast rice systems. So similar to, um, to what Barnstorm uh, was had on label for control, uh, a jigsaw has also for grass weeds. So that includes barnyard grass, silver top grass, and some of the panicum species, um, including cooler grass and, and sweet panic. Um, key for controlling these weeds is, uh, is targeting them when they're small. So up to sort of five leaf stage and, and not sort of any bigger than about seven centimetres tall um, is, is the ideal timing to really get uh, a control of those grass weeds. Um, in a difference to Barnstorm, a jigsaw also now controls uh, broadleaf weeds. So uh, they're typical typical weeds, including arrowhead, starfruit, and water plantain. 
Um, it's also active on Jerry Jerry as well. Um, and again, targeting small weeds, so up to sort of the four leaf growth stage um, and no bigger than uh, five centimetres wide. It's got a single use rate of two litres per hectare and it must be used with an adjuvant. Uh, so uptake spraying oil or similar. Um, the other adjuvants that are on label for use are Hasten spraying adjuvant and uh, MSO uh, from Loveland. And the adjuvant rate is one to two litres per hectare. Uh, we have that rate range on there just to um, have the opportunity to use the higher rate of oil with a jigsaw um, if your weeds are, are a little bit more developed or the conditions aren't as ideal as you'd like um, and the extra adjuvants is going to help um, get the herbicide into the weeds a bit better. So here's just a couple of photos to show what you can expect to see after you've applied a jigsaw into your rice and what sort of activity on, on weeds, grass weeds and broadleaf weeds you can expect. Uh, so the photo on the left is a barnyard grass plant um, a couple of weeks after application. So it's pretty much on its way out, very dead, um, dead leaves there and the very sort of swollen um, base of the plant there too. So that just comes up really easily um, if you were to push your hand through, through the rice crop to try and pull up the barnyard grass in between the rows. Um, it just comes away really easily. Similar to the photo in the middle there, um, that's only seven days after application. So you can see that the, the ends of the plant, at the base of the plant there is really quite brown and, and dying and, and swollen, but the leaves still look quite green. So it can be a bit concerning if you still think there's some um, alive barnyard grass plants. Um, but if you just, again, put your hand through the crop, try and pull them out, they should come away easily. Um, and it's very quickly acting. So um, the barnyard grass plants aren't going to be taking up any nutrients or water or competing with the rice um, very soon after application. On the right hand side there is, is just a photo to illustrate the sort of activity on broadleaf weeds. So it's a bathyspur spur plant and you just see um, it's sort of twisted up, leaves are all shriveled and dying. Um, again, that's a couple of weeks after application there. So we don't have weeds like bathyspur on the label. We do know that a jigsaw can work on, on some of these species that um, may have, you know, in the past have been controlled by, by flooding, um, but in drill uh, drill sown systems or delayed permanent water systems, these weeds can sort of flourish. So um, just keep them in the back of your mind. That's what you can sort of expect on some of those weeds. Um, there's just um, some some results from trials run a couple of years ago, um, but across the Murrumbidgee, uh, Colliambly and uh, Murray Valley areas. Um, and it was just looking at how a jigsa uh, fits in and, and complements a foundation herbicide program. Um, so this was, uh, these numbers are just looking at the average barnyard grass control in a percentage. Um, it's from five trials, um, yep, from north to south, and just looked at comparing sort of a, an untreated plot to a foundation alone treatment of Gramoxone, Stomp and Magister. Um, and then a couple of other options, which was a foundation treatment followed by a barnstorm as a bit of a standard to compare against. Um, and then just a, a barnstorm on its own and then the newer Jigsaw product on its own just to sort of see what would happen um, if you didn't get a foundation down, what level of weed control you could see. And number six, the final treatment there is, is the treatment or, or the program that we're um, in fully support of is probably the best way you can use a Jigsaw, which is a foundation of Gramoxone, Stomp and Magister at a sort of pre, post flush pre-emergence application timing, followed by Jigsaw sort of as an early post-emergence spray on young weeds. So if you can see those numbers along the bottom there, 100% control across those five trials when you had a foundation treatment followed by a jigsaw. Um, you might see that the jigsaw on its own did perform quite well, averaged out 94%, um, which is just it shows that how strong it is, and especially when you compare it to, to Barnstorm there at 79% um, control average on, on barnyard grass. And that is, is quite a difference and it's quite um, quite a high percentage too. Um, but we really don't advocate that you rely just on one product alone to do all the heavy lifting with a weed like barnyard grass in particular. Um, it's putting a lot of pressure on, on the one product. Um, and if there are escapes, there's not many backup options um, to go to if you do need to clean up again from that. So ideally your foundation should, should do a fair bit of the heavy lifting. As you can see in those results there, it was 84% control for a vineyard grass. Um, but we know, do know that 
you do sometimes need a clean up spray and a jigsaw is a really good option to do that. Um, from the same trial, this is just looking at yields. So this is the average rice yield um, for those uh, different treatments. Um, this is just data from the Wagelli and the Coliambly sites. And again, you can see you're still achieving sort of above, above 10 tonnes per hectare from just the foundation treatment there, Gramoxo Magister Stop. But as you add in those, those follow-up post-emergence treatment, whether it be Barnstorm or a Jixa on top of those foundation treatments, you're really pushing high into sort of close to 14 or over 14 tonnes per hectare. So that's you know, a combination of, of minimising that early weed competition with your foundation treatment um, and then targeting any escapes or any follow-up um, weeds that may have emerged after that foundation treatment and cleaning up with the jigsaw and you're giving the rice every potential um, to, to reach its yield. So a jigsaw is registered to be applied by both ground and air application. Um, and in a difference to barnstorm, which could have been applied sort of at one to two leaf rice stage, we really need to wait until at least three leaf on the rice day, on the rice growth stage um, before a jigsa is applied. I would just know that it uh, can cause a bit of crop effect if applied prior to that. So to minimise any of that risk, just wait until that three leaf stage and it can go right through to panic or initiation. Any weeds that have not emerged at the time of spraying won't be controlled. So there's no residual activity from a jigsa. So it needs to make contact, uh, the, you know, the spray solution needs to make contact with the weeds directly um, to control them as well. So um, there's no, yeah, no residual activity and um, just if you can get good coverage there, which is what the water volumes of um, ground, you know, minimum 80 litres uh, for ground um, applications and again, a uh, minimum of 40 litres for aerial applications. That coverage is going to be really critical to make sure that um, you're getting the most from a jigsaw. And just to re reiterate following uh, the data from before, the best results we've seen with the jigsaw over the last several seasons of our trials and, and industry demonstrations um, is when it's applied to small weeds and it's following a strong foundation herbicide program. That's when you get the most bang for your buck from the product. So here are just a couple of examples of where we see a jigsaw fitting in to some standard herbicide programs. Um, yeah, obviously and consult, uh, consult your agronomist and see whether these are gonna be an option for you. Um, but in drill stone rice systems, the, the standard three-way mix up front, Gramoxone Magister Stomp, um, and if needed, you can follow up the jigsaw for a cleanup spray if there's any uh, grass weed escapes um, or new germinations of, of grasses and broad leaves. Um, sometimes it's not an option, uh, the timings don't quite work if there's rainfall or any sort of irrigation mishaps, um, the rice has emerged and you're not able to use the gramoxone component of the three-way mix. Um, you can still get some really good uh, solid weed control from just a magister and stomp application and then followed by a jigsaw. So there's still some good modes, uh, several different modes of actions work, working on um, the weeds um, and a jigsaw provides a good cleanup option um, following that foundation. We're also still doing a bit more work in, uh, into delayed permanent water systems and whether there's an option to include in that post-emergence application uh, a stomp in with the Ajixa to provide that residual control um, prior to permanent water going on. So uh, still looking at that, but might be the option to, to have a Gramoxone Magistrate up front um, and then followed early by Ajixa and stomp um, to, to control weeds at the time that they have emerged and the stomp can provide some residual there. So. Um, just something to, to consider, and that's what we're working on further. Um, and in your aerial systems, um, aerial dry broadcast rice systems, um, just your standard all dram type band up front um, can be followed by a jigsaw if needed um, for any cleanup um, in, in that permanent water systems. Um, really critical though is that if you are looking to use a jigsaw this way, is that the water's dropped down to expose those weeds. So it doesn't have the ability to move through the water to get contact with any weeds that have emerged. So it needs to, the weeds need to be above the water surface um, and exposed so that the jigsa can, can get in contact with them and work that way. A jigsa is maybe one of the first products for the rice industry that has really defined uh, buffer zones or downwind no spray zones on the label. Um, it's a requirement now from ACVMA that all new products have these really defined um, buffer zones. And another requirement from APVMA is that 
um, all, all applications must be made with a coarse spray droplet size. Um, can't go any, any finer than that. Uh, so these tables just have um, the sort of the different buffer zones and, and the different heights of the boom above the sort of target canopy and they're really defined um, distances there. So please take a look at the label um, and consult with your agronomist or your contractor to make sure everyone understands um, what these buffer zones mean. Um, as the product can be applied um, by air as well, there's also really um, defined downwind no-spray zones, buffer zones for aerial application for both fixed wind and for helicopter applications. So again, have a chat with your agronomist and um, your aerial applicator um, to make sure yeah, everyone understands uh, what and interprets this correctly to make sure you're applying it, uh, the product in the best way to make sure that um, yeah, you're not, you're not putting anything at risk in terms of off-target of um, drift or damage onto sort of neighbouring areas. Um, compatibility is a, a reasonably uh, complicated um, process for, for developing new herbicides. Um, so these are just um, some trial results from what we've looked at so far with um, products that might be compatible with the Jigsa. Um, at this stage, we can only support um, any of those products that are on our label at the time. And that, as of today, that is just the adjuvant. So uptake, Hastings for adjuvant and MSO with, with Lecky Tech from, um, from Loveland. We do know that, that Laws Van Insecticide and, and Stomp herbicide are biologically compatible though. So that means that they mix readily with Ajixa. Uh, they're safe to the rice and there's no reduction in any grass weed control. Um, we also know that products uh, Transform Insecticide and Londax herbicide are what we call physically compatible. So uh, they mix readily, they're safe to, to the rice, but there is the potential for, for reduction in the grass weed control compared to say Ajixa on its own. Um, incompatible products that we've, um, we've worked out so far are Fastac and Bassagram. Um, so they might mix readily with Jigsa, um, but they can be either unsafe to the rice, cause too much crop effect, um, and can reduce the weed control or, or both. So um, just watch this space. We're still working on, on these, uh, these compatibility mixes, and hopefully in the next label update, we can um, include some of these products on there. Um, so yeah, like mentioned before, um, a jigsaw needs to make contact with the weeds directly to work. Um, so if you're applying it, um, say by air, and there's still water in the fields, um, make sure that uh, the water's dropped so that the weeds are, um, are exposed. At least you know three quarters of the weed is above the flood water to get that contact. Similar to what you may have experienced with barnstorm, if there's any moisture stress on uh, the barnyard grass in particular, you're really not going to get a very good result. Um, so ideally, if you can, if you can treat, uh, apply a jigsaw when there's still water in the paddock, um, that's going to be the, the best um, application scenario. Uh, for those that are applying by a ground rig, this obviously isn't possible. But um, as soon as you can get um, a rig onto the onto the bays and um, treat those weeds, they, if there's any stress, um, please refrain from application at the time and, and look to apply it another time when there's no stress there. Um, and again, as soon as the as soon as you're off the paddock, um, either yeah, start irrigation again or, or bring the water up um, as soon as you can. So yeah, no later than two hours after application. Uh, it's rain fast in one hour, but ideally in real life, as the rig comes off, put the water back on. Um, and just hold the water um, in your in your systems on farm systems um, for minimum seven days before if you know if it's the potential to release back into irrigation channels, uh, just hold off for seven days. So that's everything I had in Logixa. Um, I'll just now quickly cover off a few points on Ubenic herbicide. Uh, so Ubenic is the straight rinse corrective product and it's only active on broadleaf weeds and, and sedges, suppression of, of sedges. So those broadleaf weeds are arrowhead, jerry jerry, star fruit and water plantain. Um, and again, similar to Logixa, targeting small weeds, um, no bigger than four leaf or more than five centimetres wide. Um, and Sedges Dirty Door, it's a suppression claim only. Um, it's just not strong enough, unfortunately, on Dirty Door and um, only up to the two leaf stages where we've seen uh, any sort of strong suppression there. So that's where, unfortunately, where it lets it down, but it is really, really strong broadleaf weed herbicide. Uh, one use rate and a low use rate of 150 mils per hectare. 
Uh, and again, must be used with an adjuvant um, uptake or, or hasten. Uh, it's quite a high rate of, of oil there. It's two to four litres. Um, and it's a scenario where it needs to be pre-mixed. The uh, ubenic and the oil needs to be pre-mixed together um, thoroughly, like minimum 15 minutes, to really ensure that each sort of little, little molecule of that ubenic is, is covered in the oil to, so it can uh, move rapidly across the surface of the water and then down through the water profile as well. Um, as it needs to be applied directly into flood water, um, it's only registered for use by, by a squirt or, or bickley boom, so most likely put out by a plane or helicopter. Um, don't try and apply this um, as a, a post-emergent foliar spray. It, it's not going to work. Uh, just a couple of examples of, of activity from ubenic on weeds. So uh, for Dirty Dora there, on the, the three little plants that are on the left-hand side are about seven days after spraying of ubenic. You can see that the leaves are starting to go a bit yellow. Um, again, the, the base of the plant there before the roots is, is sort of swollen. Um, and you compare that to the untreated little dirty dora plant on the right-hand side of that photo. Um, it's still quite nicely green and, and healthy. And, um, and the base of the plant there is white and, and sort of actively growing and taking up nutrients. And the photo on the right just shows a, a star fruit plant that's had eubenic on it. And you can see it's sort of twisting up, the leaves are cupping. Um, that's pretty very classic symptoms of, of group I rinse grow active on, um, on those broadleaf weeds. Uh, so like I said, it's a really, really strong broadleaf weed killer. Um, these are just the average percent control uh, across a number of trials over the last couple of seasons. Um, so, you know, close to 100% each time for water plantain, star fruit, Arrowhead and Jerry Jerry, so really, really strong. Uh, unfortunately, it's just the dirty door. We couldn't achieve uh, that 100% control um, consistently across the board. Uh, so again, it's Ubenix as a, a post-emergence application, so not part of the foundation or, or early um, herbicide programs in, in aerosol or, or dry broadcast systems, um, and it is applied via squirt. Uh, again, similar to a jigsaw, we need to wait till rice is at the three leaf stage. Um, just to minimise any crop effect. And again, it can be applied through the panicle initiation. Similar to a jigsaw, there's no residual activity from eubenic. And so again, only weeds that have emerged at the time of spraying will be controlled. Um, and again, coverage is, um, is important there. So you can go as minimum five litres of water in the mix, but you can go up to 20 litres. So factoring in the 150 mils eubenic and the you know, potentially two to four litres uh, per hectare of oil. Uh, here's just a couple of examples of, of where we see Ubenic fitting into some herbicide programs. So standard um, standard program of Ordram Typan. Um, if needed, if there's any broadleaf weeds that um, are quite prolific or need a follow-up spray, then Ubenic um, can be the option there. Um, if you're just going with a straight Ordram, uh, where there's light, dirty door pressure and, and um, it's not so much a weed of concern, um, but other broadleaf weeds might be, uh, again, you can follow by Ubenic at the um, after the three leaf stage of rice. I oh, was just doing a few bit more work on uh, programs around satin. Uh, so whether that be a, a dry soil application of satin followed by ubenic um, at, once the rice is up and away um, or a split satin application. So part of the satin up front um, and then followed by a mix of satin and ubenic following. Uh, so that there yeah, might be some potential there and, and see if there's other options um, to take some pressure off of Wardram and Taipan as um, some standard um, upfront applications. Again, the best results and, and what's been confirmed with us across our sort of several years of trials and, and demonstrations is that you're going to get the best from a product when you're applying it to small weeds and when there's other herbicides that are also doing some lifting on this. Um, neither of these products are silver bullets. Um, they're just another tool in the box to make sure that um, you can continue to grow rice um, and have some some strong herbicide options uh, moving into the future. Uh, again, we've got a couple of products here that um, we do know are compatible with Uvenic. Um, but again, the only thing on label at this stage are the adjuvants, um, so uptake, hasten, and MSO. Um, but we do know that Ordram, Titan, and Satin are physically compatible. Uh, with eubenic, but there could be, you know, a potential for a reduction in some of the weed control compared to eubenic um, on its own. So again, more work to do here, and hopefully in the future we can have some of these products on the label. 
Um, so even though ubenic is applied into flood water, um, we really do advise that you try and avoid any sort of water movement um, up to 12 hours before uh, applying a product um, and try and maintain the depth of about five to seven centimetres, which is sort of ideal to allow the, the solution to sort of spread out across the surface of the water um, through the rice and then, and then drop down through the water profile to make contact with the weeds. So if the water's muddy or it's too shallow or if there's um, sort of it's uneven and some soil is exposed and some of the crop is, is much deeper than say seven centimetres, um, that yeah, you're not going to get the best result from that. Um, and after application, just lock up for five days and avoid any any water movements in or out um, to let Ubenic do its best. That's it from me, Chart. I'm happy to take any questions now. Um, but again, just get in contact with your agronomist if you think either of these products um, might have a fit in your programs for this year. Um, or please feel free to get in contact with me directly um, or via Rice Extension. Thanks, Connie. Is there any questions about using either of those chemicals um, in your crops this season? Alrighty, since there's no questions, I will move on. So our next presenter is Malcolm Taylor and Malcolm's just going to give a presentation about weed management and the chemicals that are available. So Malcolm, I will hand over control if you would like to change the slides. Uh, history shown you would probably be better to do the changes. Yep, alrighty. No I'll worries. concentrate on chatting and I'll disappear here so that won't uh, affect the uh, sound. So thanks very much, Charlton. What I'd like to do is take you back to remind you of some base principles in rice weed management and then some comments in relation to getting the best out of your programs. Look, we talk, term it as integrated weed management. It is very much about getting the best out of the investment you make, coupled with sustaining it against the development of resistance. Resistance in, to herbicides is not an academic concept in relation to our crop because we've had the Londex experience uh, and certainly throughout Asia, there's widespread Group A resistance now in barnyard grass and leptochloa populations. Um, we have a clear option to rotate fields. We're forced to do that in many cases due to water availability and seasonal changes. Uh, we know that by alternating seeding methods, you get a different flora that you're targeting and also you get to use different modes of action Herbicides change. Uh, we also know that within any given field, depending on how you manage the water, you'll get a different weed flora. So on the left-hand side of that lower slide, uh, in the ponded area, you'd expect to get sedges and broadleaf aquatics. On the right-hand side of the bank, you would expect to get grass weeds because of the exposure of the mud. So, uh, field grades are very important in uh, getting even challenges and also delivering herbicides in an even manner. Uh, stubbles are generally of a negative nature in uh, rice establishment because they can tie up herbicides and they can shield weeds from knockdown herbicides. Ultimately, we aim to deliver multiple modes of action for each of the weed species for the same cohort of weeds, because that's a base principle in trying to prevent the swing towards herbicide resistance in the populations change. So we're coming back to now situation now, or well, hopefully for rice fields, they may have been uh, prepared early. That may not be the case because there'd probably be quite a bit of uh, follow on cropping after winter pastures or winter crops. Uh, cultivation's got a role because uh, ultimately barnyard grass uh, will be germinating now as the weather's starting to turn warm and the ground is moist. So if you can get a glyphosate in there, uh, that's a very cheap non-selective herbicide that's going to take out any of the early emerging weeds. Uh, but be wary what you mix with glyphosate because uh, Metsulfuron will carry through and so will 2,4-D and potentially impact on 
rice seeding, oh, sorry, uh, developing uh, seedling rice. Carfentrazone has got a very short uh, soil uh, residual, so it would be a better option for taking out, so enhancing broadleaf kill with a glyphosate mix change. Critically important to take out those early germinating weeds. They are the most competitive and they are the most costly to control. Change. Uh, I think Brian talked to you about uh, seeding depth. Uh, the uniformity of seeding enhances your ability to time uh, herbicide treatments in drill seeded rice. Uh, and by going a little bit deeper, you just get a few extra days, which may be important to you if you're waiting to traffic a field. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Change. The most important treatment in drill sown culture is getting on post flushing prior to crop emergence. Uh, that enables you to use cheap knockdown in the form of paraquat or bromoxone. Uh, plus two uh, res selective residuals, Magister and Stomp. They are alternate modes of action, uh, quite different in their behaviour in terms of solubility. Uh, and so they give you a very broad spectrum of pre-emergence weed control in drill sown rice. But that mix must go on prior to the crop emergence. Otherwise, the paraquat component, the gramoxone, will kill young rice seedlings. So it's uh, an important window change. It does work. In the bottom left hand corner, you have untreated and you can see the level of competition from barnyard grass there. Foreground on the right is a propanil based treatment, which has given a fair burn down, but it's actually not that good. Uh, rear left hand side is a magister based treatment, which is bleaching everything rice included, but the weeds will recover there. The three-way mix on the rear right has taken out all the weed competition early, the crops emerged, and it's often running without any competition. That's where you want to be. Change. So on paper, it's pretty simple, that three-way mix at the timing where the crop has yet to emerge, but the flush has occurred, the ground has been sealed, and the gr uh, grass weeds are starting to germinate. There's a need to get some moisture on there to fix the two residuals. Uh, I won't go into any more detail. The rates are very clearly listed in the Rice Crop Protection Guide. However, change, if you don't get it on, what do you do? Well, there's an option to use STAM or propanil that would be substituted for the gramoxone component. Propanil is not very good in cool weather, works well in the tropics. Uh, it's not going to take out large grass weeds and it won't take out silvertop grass. It's also much more expensive than dromoxone. So you can see the incentive to go with the three-way mix on time. But that it, uh, it does offer you an alternate option if you've missed it, you've missed the timing. The new alternative, as Connie has pointed out, is a jigsaw. Uh, we know that it is compatible with Stomp, but it mustn't go on before three leaf stage. The other alternative is Aura, which has been around for a while. It's another group A. In both instances of a Jixa and Aura, they've got to go on turgid weeds to be uh, translocated in the weed. Uh, and they need to uh, then, one way of ensuring that is to commence the flood immediately. You've applied them. They're rain fast within about an hour. Switching now to water seeded rice, um, you need to put some parameters on that because if you allow too long to take in the fill up phase, you'll end up with a lack of synchrony between rice and weed development stages. And then that makes it uh, more difficult to time herbicides accurately. So having clean channels, the things will fill quickly this year because there's a reasonable amount of soil, um, subsoil moisture. Set yourself a five day target. Make sure that water movement has ceased before the treatments go on into the water and be wary that treated water mustn't leave the farm. Of course, there's no incentive for that to happen, but we don't want to see it in any drainage uh, ending up in um, uh, water courses. Change. 
The most common and very reliable treatment is a tank mix of Taipan for the sedges and broadleafs, coupled with Audram for the grass weeds and a bit of dirty Dora suppression. Uh, by delivering that at sowing with the water uh, movement stopped, you can then add Lawsban for a bloodworm treatment. Bloodworm, uh, sorry, rice is particularly susceptible to bloodworms when the radical is coming out of the germinating seed. So by having that on, on the day of sowing, you are assured that the rice is not going to be impacted by bloodworms. Um, later bloodworm infestations may or may not warrant treatment because uh, certainly once rice has the ability, is uh, producing secondary roots, it has an ability to recover from some feeding. There's certainly a greater tolerance to bloodworms at that stage, but critically important at sowing. Those can be delivered into flood water uh, with the Bickley boom by air or by squirt. So you have a way of minimising drift uh, and both onto pre-germinated or dry broadcast. Keep going. Very broad spectrum, uh, safe to all the crop varieties and uh, commonly you will see some dirty door escapes particularly if the crop is slow to uh, fill in uh, with uh, uh, canopy closure. That can be addressed through a post-emergence satin treatment or M60, Bassagran M60, applied with the water down uh, at an early tillering stage. You can even go on to about three leaf stage, but normally you wouldn't get exposure at that stage. But there's a lot of detail presented. There's a new rice crop protection guide out yesterday. Uh, it's a fantastic document. There's over 40 years of uh, experience by many different people that's gone into that document uh, in great detail. And I don't know anywhere else in the world that has such a resource. So I can commend that to you, Change. Uh, going back to water seeding, the, I mentioned satin, or well, that's into flood water. Uh, can be done with a big leaf boom. It's going to pick up grasses and dirty dora, not on broad leaves. Uh, it won't take out large weeds. And there's a few of the long grown varieties that may not be suited to that mix or that combination. Eubenic uh, has been discussed earlier, uh, starting from a three leaf stage. Um, broad leaves only, it's weak on dirty dora. Uh, but safe on all the varieties. So those are options that can be delivered into flood water. Alternatively, if you atomize these materials, you can drop them, uh, you'll need to drop the water. And in doing so, you run the risk of late barnyard grass germination. So that starts to get a bit trickier. Um, however, the options are M60, and that can go on from a relatively early stage because it's got good crop safety. Um, and both uh, M60 and MCPA are active on a wide spectrum of sedges and broadleafs. Um, MCPA is going on at a little later stage. It's more prone to causing you root pruning. Uh, and the uh, situation I'd be particularly cautious about with MCPA is if you've got a late sown variety like the end, uh, which is going to have to go through its vegetative phase quite quickly, you really don't want to be hammering that with MCPA. So uh, M60, Vascaran M60, I think is the preferred treatment for atomization for the sedges and broadleaves. Alternatively, a new one there, a Jixa, which although it's weak on Dirty Dora, it's actually quite strong on broadleaves and grasses. So if you've got a mixed, a mixed escape there of uh, barnyard grass and some broadleaf weeds, well, then that would be the product of choice. Uh, or, of course, it's been around for some time, a group A for grasses only. So all those need to be atomised with an attendant risk of drift. Change. There was quite a prospect this year of recropping rice after winter crops. Uh, many of those winter crops have had herbicides used on them. So the question is, well, will there be carryover effects? Well, there's a lot of uh, uh, issues that would impact 
on whether a herbicide has broken down or not in time. Those are listed there. What we do know, and we don't have a huge amount of experience here, but uh, Secura and imidazolin owns like uh, on duty are, uh, have very long plant back periods. Those are spelt out in the rice crop protection guide uh, and they're spelt out for good reason because those particular materials are particularly damaging to uh, seedling rice. Experience has shown that if a field's had a group B, such as low gram or glean, or some of the other group Bs, you should be very wary about following those with a Londex treatment because you can get a compounding effect uh, and reduced rice seedling root development. We've also seen uh, triazines persist after canola crops, and that's more likely on an alkaline soil type. Uh, so you need to be wary of those. Here's an example where Secure has been applied twice the rate two months prior to drill seeding with no disturbance. And you can see how it's impacted on rice seedling density and plant vigor. So these are real impacts uh, capable of lowering yields. So you need to be cautious there. If you are concerned, go out to those the fields in question Sample at multiple points. You only really need to be sampling in the top three inches, I would suggest. Bulk that sample up, then subsample it. Take a similar sample from an adjoining field or buffer area that hasn't had the herbicide in question. Uh, and so line those up side by side, change. Uh, seed is available through rice extension if you want to do a bioassay then cover it if it's going to be drill sown or leave it exposed if it's going to be water seeded. Water it up, drain it, or let it come down quickly. If it's a uh, drill sown situation, leave it flooded if it's going to be a water seeded situation. And then watch over a period of about a month, compare the vigor of the two. Uh, if you're seeing a substantial difference and a diminution of growth in the treated field, you know you've got a problem. There's really not much about rice establishment that can't be predicted and planned in a calendar sense. The one thing that will in be uh, variable, of course, is the weather and particularly rainfall events. But by uh, making a plan at the outset before you sow anything, it puts you ahead in terms of being able to predict operations. And uh, prediction, of course, uh, enables you to be on time and get the maximum out of what may well be a, a four to five thousand dollar per hectare crop. So there's serious money at risk here, and it warrants a a more professional um, approach to planning. We're coming out of a lean period. Um, there's not a lot of stock out there. Rice products tend to be specialised for rice only. There are some that we use, particularly in drill seeded, that are common, and therefore they should be available. So please check now and do your planning with resellers to make sure you're not caught short without a specialist product that you need for your crop. That's really what I've got to say, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thanks, Malcolm. Is there any questions to Malcolm that anyone has, whether it be about, um, you know, residuals from winter ke winter chemicals or anything for this season? Um, Malcolm is available during the season too if someone wants to contact him outside of today. Uh, All right. I had a, a query yesterday from someone saying, with the three-way mix, what's the... Um, What's the advantages and disadvantages of actually splitting it? So doing either Gramoxone, um, Magister and come back later with Stomp or, or a, a Gramoxone early with Stomp, Magister later. Is that, where's the plus or the minuses for that? Okay, the theory of course is that, well, do we do less injury to the rice if we delay the Stomp component? And there's little evidence for that but I have uh, convincing evidence that if you split them, 
you'll do a poorer job. So we've fiddled with that now for getting on for 20 years and the current recommendation is the best treatment. Does that answer your question, Mark? Right on. Very good. Yeah. Thanks, Mel. Good luck. Can't see any other questions in the chat box, so. Yeah, thank you for that. Just before we get underway uh, with my little presentation, we do, we're fortunate enough to have um, the Chair of Grower Services from the Sunrise Board, John Bradford, online. So, um, John would like to just uh, address some of the um, questions around the price of the, the seed. So, John, do you want to? Yeah, no, thanks. Comments? Yeah, thanks, Troy. And I'm sorry I'm outside. So, um, look, it's, it's a good question. We did raise that. The Bruce, could we do it over two years? Uh, but the problem is the policies within Sunrise is we shut off a year, the calendar year, we shut off everything and there's no carryover pricing. So it's a commercial price of $800 a seed growers got last year. It is actually subsidised because when you take out the 75% yield, um, it's a bit over $1,066. So, uh, and this, these prices will reduce next year as well because we're on the, the back of the... Um, the poor price, the it's relative to that. So hopefully that answers your question, Bruce. Uh, and look, can I say how good this meeting's been? Um, yeah, it's it's I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, the Sherpa and Opus have continually been looked at to see when we can drop them in. Uh, it's dependent on our global marketing, trying to find markets with the right price, the volumes and, and milling programs as well. And all receivable sites will get looked at as regional volumes come in as well. We're trying to open as many sites as possible to um to make it the ease of uh, receivables so i hope that's an answer to your questions sure oh, good thanks john appreciate that so my presentation this morning is we've been sitting here for two hours and we've heard a lots lots of theory from um, um from our speakers so it's to try and summarize that and put the theory into practice so uh, we've got four um, topics i'll be addressing this morning uh, which is the key steps to growing high yields, high yielding rice crops, double cropping with VN, that looks like our best option um, this year. Uh, I've been asked a few questions about gross margins for growing rice, so we'll have a, a discussion about that. And then how do you access a lot of the rice extension and industry resources? So this is uh, particularly aimed at people that haven't grown for a couple of years, just as a refresher. Um, it's also aimed at those people who do want to lift their average yields um, by a ton or two to try and get in that top 20% or to get to average. So the first one is the 10 key steps to high yielding drill sown rice. So as I said, this is um, for those people who are getting really high yields, continue to do what you want to do. But there is certainly no silver bullet out there with what the top 20% are doing. So the industry's uh, rice extension and um, industry, like DPI and, and grower services, et cetera, we've got together. We thought, what are some critical components of growing uh, you know, high yielding rice crop? So we've come up with, uh, for each sowing method, there's um, a different set of steps, but for drill sowing, we concentrate on that. I, I did see in the pre-poll where um, we had everyone on was very confident of growing aerial sown rice. So I thought I'd concentrate on the drill sown rice where we had some people not so confident. So it, at each st uh, crop stage, critical stage of growth, which we can see on the left hand side, there's some key steps that we think is really important, the fundamentals of getting a high yielding rice crop. So the number one is where we're at now, paddock preparation. So we should be really concentrating on that, getting a consolidated seed bed um, that's got no low, low spots to maximise that emergence and allow timeliness of operation. So we've heard Brian talk about, you know, if you've got a low spot, it doesn't matter how many, how high a seeding rate you put on it, they still won't emerge. So that's really important at this stage that, um, you know, your ground should be prepped or pretty close to it, run that wide board over it just to cover them low spots and maximise your, your emergence. And also it gets uh, evenness of emergence. So therefore it helps you with your weed control program, which Malcolm just touched on. 
Another thing we should be looking at now is planting within the sowing window for your variety and region. Very critical. This is, and so um, also we're looking at the sowing rate. So currently we're, people are putting in their seed orders. So this is where we should be looking at what variety am I growing? How am I going to sow it? And what's the seeding rate? So as Brian mentioned, if you've got a really good, if you drill sowing, you've got a very good machine, you can drop them sowing rates back to, you know, around 100 kilos for some variety. So, and up to a maximum 150 uh, kilos there as well. So that, that's the, the two areas, the three steps that we should be really concentrating on at the minute. Um, then as we progress through the season, uh, there's the other critical steps as Malcolm talked about, apply the three-way mix application, post-flush and pre-emergence, and we'll follow these throughout the season. So you'll hear a lot of um, rice extension will be referring to these key steps a lot throughout the season in a number of ways. So at our small face-to-face -face grower discussion groups, we'll be focusing on these. Um, we'll also, the podcast series that's about, that will be launched um, series two um, later in this month, we'll be focusing on each of these steps. So we're really trying to communicate as much as we can about the basic fundamental um, practices of growing a high yielding rice crop. So yes, it is very simple. There is no magic bullet, but to, to maximize your chances, um, it, these are the 10 key steps to follow for a drill sowing crop. Then, yeah, as I said, Similarly, for aerial sown, there is 13 key steps. But at this time of the year, we're at the same, um, we're at the same stage, really concentrating on that paddock preparation. The other thing, so obviously this year, yeah, there's uh, growers will be looking at doing some double cropping. I know there hasn't been a lot of rice ground left out. Um, so over the years, we've done lots of case studies um, looking at double cropping, particularly when Viand and K5 was released some years ago. Um, we, yeah, we really followed some crops through, but the key to successful double cropping is get organized. So for example, you must have your machinery ready and, and waiting to sow into that window. So if you're doing a, a hay crop or you're harvesting your canola, you've got to be there ready to go. Um, so that's very important. Like as Malcolm said as well, you need to make a plan. So start planning now. Early preparation is the key to great performance. So also in that planning, aim for the start of the window, the sowing window, because you never know whether, you know, whether events can push that out and there's a clear correlation about yields compared to um, sowing windows and I'll show you that in a couple of slides um, ahead. Layouts and infrastructure must be ready. Uh, only you've got a very tight turnaround so potentially only time to grade a board or maybe a, you know run the uh, quick till over a couple of times to get a um, if it's uneven but yeah you've got very short amount of time so make sure your layouts and your infrastructure are ready to go so you know, run over your banks with your disbanker now before harvest or before that hay crop and yeah, ensure any new infrastructure is installed. And the third point is what Malcolm just finished up with about making sure there's no residual winter crop herbicide. So we have seen damage uh, over the last five years to varying degrees from uh, residual herbicide. So it, it's certainly well worth, if you are unsure, to do a biosase as Malcolm said. So yes, double cropping is an opportunity, um, but as further to what I was saying, in 2017, we did a, a survey um, of all VN growers. And what this is showing is the later you sow, the lower the yield. So exactly what I was saying. So if you look in the right hand column, those crops that were harvested in March averaged 10.9 tonnes a hectare. Those in April, which was 48% of the crop, 10.5 tonne. Then we went to May, so 9.5 tonne average for 44% of the crops. We also know if we're harvesting in May, we're running into um, weather conditions. So it makes it harder to get that harvest completed. And then there was 5% of the crops in June 
uh, which averaged 8.8. So some two tonne less than um, those in March. So timeliness is very important. As I said, really same uh, aim for that, the beginning of the selling window. Um, so this is just another example uh, of showing you how, so if we look at the second line of sowing date, we can see these four commercial crops were grown from the 29th, were sown from the 29th of October through to the 27th of November. And if we come down to the very bottom line, we can see the yield difference um, by sowing date. So 12.3 tonnes a hectare, which was sown in the window down to 11.1, .1, which is you know, on the edge of the window on the 27th of November. Uh, there's also, I think Mark mentioned it about a lot of people look at yield for they the first thing they go to is about nitrogen management. They say how how much nitrogen did the the um, top yield crops use? As we can see, there's no correlation uh, in these examples. So we've got the top crop used 460 kilos a hectare total. That is urea, whereas the lowest yielding crop used he uh, variable rated between 435 and 465. So it's just, a, I guess, to reiterate what Mark's saying that it's more about timeliness than uh, nitrogen management. Although granted nitrogen management does have a role to play. So what's our options in the Murray Valley uh, for double cropping? It, it will be VAND this year. Um, so this is just showing our sowing windows. So noting also as Brian said about the aerial dry broadcast method, you will increase your, the potential lodging. But it does extend your sowing window if you are running really late, particularly if you're harvesting a barley crop or a, a wheat or an early wheat crop, it does give you a little bit more flexibility. I think what we've seen over the years, it's better to sow in the in the within the window and manipulate your management of an aerial dry broadcast crop. Uh, is more beneficial than sowing late. So some of that manipulation could be your nitrogen management, also your um, seeding rate can assist with uh, lodging. So, so yeah, so if you're thinking about double cropping now, start your plan with one of these dates in mind, depending on what sowing method you're using. So work backwards from there. So that's pretty important to get that plan going. Uh, so this is a, a case study of a, a VN crop in the Murray Valley. Remember, uh, we didn't have too many uh, VN crops when in 2016-17 because we had K5 at the time and a lot of these were grown, a lot of VN was grown in the MIA. But this was uh, one example which shows you, um, I was saying with the disc seed on the 10th of November, the first flush was on the 12th of November uh, so it's a simple three flush uh, program, then going to permanent water on the 18th of December. And then it had a overall yield of 12.2 tonne a hectare. So um, as you can see, the urea was 250 kilos pre-permanent water and top dress with 100 in the 18th of uh, January. So there's a lot of double cropping case studies on our on the rice extension website for you to go and refresh yourself um, or see how other other growers have um, yeah have grown double cropping successfully. Um, also, other case studies. There was a question about mid -se mid season drydown. Uh, there is a case study of the Chalmers on our website, which is a well worth reading. I think the, the points, uh, because they do mid-season drawdown, the main points out of that case study is you've got to, once again, you've got to plan for it because it will push PI back a little bit. So uh, Michael sows at the beginning of the window, therefore allowing that drawdown period to uh, push your PI back, but still within the first two weeks of January. So it's really important that you do plan for it. and I encourage anyone to go and read that um, case study as well. I think a lot of people have mitigated the straight head as well in the Western Murray Valley through drill sowing as well. So that's um, another way to do that. Let's 
just waiting for my slide to move. Which it doesn't seem to want to. There we go. So this is just showing um, where you can get the case studies. And so you go to the Rice Extension website, go to resources, and that tab will drop down and you've got the grower case studies. Another way to do it, if you've got a, a certain topic, you can go to the search function in the top left hand corner of the Rice Extension website. So for example, um, yeah, you just might, go drill sowing or you might search for viand in there and it'll bring up all the case studies that are relevant to that um, topic. Charlie, I want you to get, you might have to um, pass them, uh, do the uh, controls. Thanks. So gross margins, well, it, it's very, I really want to emphasize, I'm hesitant to, to do any gross margins when growers ring me up because it's really important to do your own. There is no average farmer, there is no model crop, no two farms are the same. So that's why you would have seen this slide before, this is from uh, C14, this slide, so it is an old slide, but so very relevant to why you need to do your own uh, gross margin. So this was some work done by John Fowler from the Murray Local Land Services and Leah Garnett. And what it shows, if you look in the, in the red, uh, so where the gross margin per hectare without purchase irrigation costs. So out of these um, 18 farms, which th there was a, a mix of uh, aerial sown, drill sown, um, some grown on groundwater, etc. So it was a mix of farms. But what you can see is the costs per hectare range from 1,931 to 3,604. So this is without any water or irrigation purchase water. So there's a difference of 1,673. If we go and look at it per megalitre basis, there's a difference of $100 per megalitre. So, and then if you throw in another variable of purchasing water, it, it gets even greater. So we've got a $184 per megalitre difference between the lowest farm and the highest. So just really want to make that point that um, you've got to do your own. So next slide, please, Charlie. So I did uh, just for an example to show you, so how you can do some gross margins is go to ricescenario.sunrise.com.au or you can Google rice scenario or go to the rice extension website and there's a tab on under resources. You can find the um, gross margin calculator. So this is done for Rizika 10.6 tonnes this season. Um, I picked a midpoint price. You can see up the top there. Uh, their increments are $20, uh, so midpoint price of $420, so that's going on the indicative pool price of $390 to $450. So I've picked that mid price, and this is um, a, a margin per hectare, so we've got roughly, if you get 10.6 tonnes, which is the average for Rizik in the Murray Valley, at $420, it's a $3,000 uh, a hectare um, margin you'll make. So similarly, if the price goes up to 450 or 460, you can see you'll make an extra $300 a hectare. If you're um, two tonne below the, um, or a tonne below, obviously your profit per hectare decreases. Next slide, please, Charlie. So in the uh, rice scenario template, so for the sensitivity tables, you've got two options. So you can do it margin per hectare, which we just looked at, or margin per megalitre. So it depends 
on how you want to assess um, the viability of growing a rice crop. So this is the 226 in the square in the middle. So that's under that same scenario using 13 megalitres of water uh, in a drill zone crop, at getting the average at a $420 price is 226. If you can get in the top 20%, so we add a couple of um, tonne to that, you, you can see it really goes up well, over $268 per megalitre. So once again, I yeah, really encourage you to jump on and do your own. Um, similarly, you know, if you're below average, you can see it gets down to $183 a tonne. So this is a sensitivity table. It, it allows you to look at your risk um, at, on price and yield. So next slide, please, Charlie. So we've also done some case studies from last year, 2020 uh, case studies. They're on a range of topics. Um, certainly we had a big focus on growing rice on groundwater. So that's a really good read to get an understanding of um, best management practices. If you're um, going to grow your rice on groundwater again this year, um, it's one that would be pretty relevant to a lot of people this year is the success of, of Vian crops, so 12 tonne a hectare um, at Collie. So that's a, um, a good read as well and very relevant. And then we talk about some of the double cropping uh, options as well from 2020. I guess people always ask, yeah, how do you get that top yield? How do you get that 15 tonnes a hectare? So we're fortunate enough that um, we could do a case study on the Turners who have uh, grown a, a 15 tonne a hectare over, 15 tonne a hectare receipt crop two years in a row. So yes, you, you You'll go read it and you go, well, what's he doing different to me? And as I said earlier, it really comes down to timeliness. I guess it's one of these things you can't go down to the pub and someone says, oh yeah, I PI'd, my crop PI'd today and I'm top dressing tomorrow and you run home and top dress tomorrow. You've got to look at your own crop. It's about timeliness. Your crop could have PI'd five days prior or a week prior. So it's really important that you do everything on time and not as you see your neighbour doing it. Next slide, please, Charlie. Next slide, when you're ready, Charlie, thanks. Might be my internet. And yeah, I only have one slide to go, and that's just yeah, showing you where you get the resources uh, that we've been talking about, variety guides, uh, rice crop protection guides, etc. So um, that's pretty much me done, unless there's any questions. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Troy. All right, now I'm just going to hand over to Patrick O'Brien, who's from the New South Wales DPI. He's just going to give us an update about the um, wildlife control and duck control in rice for this season. Thank you. Were you going to um, share? Right, yep, here we go. Cool. Uh, thank you. Yeah, look, just the usual uh, update about um, duck mitigation on your rice crops uh, from me. So just a, a short presentation to go through relatively uh, quickly just to update you all. Hoping that the next slide might have to share, share that again with me so I can um, change the slides. That doesn't appear to be, uh, the slides don't appear to be uh, changing for me. All right, here we go. Cool. So, uh, just a quick program summary. So we, we do uh, conduct uh, 
Gamebird surveys or duck surveys uh, each year. And, and so we, we did that again this year. Uh, in May, we do our on-ground surveys uh, using drones. And then in June, we do our aerial surveys um, in helicopters. And uh, we get a, a final research report based on those surveys. And so uh, for this year, the estimated population of ducks in the Riverina is, is 463,045, which, which is an increase of 70,000 ducks on last year's survey. So the key message for me uh, really is, is, is just to, um, I guess, advise landholders who, who do grow rice this year to, to plan ahead and to use a combination of non-lethal control methods as well as licensed hunters to achieve sustained effective control. So in terms of the estimation of ab abundance and sustainable harvest quotas for 2020, 2021, uh, the main three species uh, are grey teal, Australian wood duck and Pacific black duck. So they, they make up about 98% of the estimated ducks in the Riverina and they, they're obviously the three main species that impact uh, rice crops. Uh, the column on the right is the actual quotas. That can be, uh, so the number of ducks per species that can be harvested or killed in New South Wales for that financial year. So down the bottom you can see 46,304. So basically that's that's a 10%, uh, uh, that figure is 10% of the estimated abundance in the Riverina. And so that's where we establish our sustainable harvest quota from. And to put things in perspective, last year, the harvest of ducks for the, for the entire year was 712. So to have a quota of 46,000 for this year is, is, is pretty healthy. And I, and I don't think uh, we'll be exceeding that number. So just again, a, a reminder for growers uh, who are putting rice in this year, if you do want to opt in for the Native Game Bird Management Program, you can do so on the rice seed order form. So you need to refer to your uh, seed circular first. There's a whole um, bunch of information in that to, to read through. And if you satisfy uh, those requirements, uh, then you can opt in for a license on your seed order form. So it's just as simple as ticking the yes box and then selecting an a property allocation. Uh, so we've got allocation one, two, and three. And again, your seed circular refers to what those allocations mean. It's basically, it's just the amount of ducks that you, um, you want applied to your license each year. Growers who aren't growing rice this year and have other crops that are being impacted uh, can still apply for a license or a property allocation uh, and they can do so on just a standard application form and, and uh, you can email them, that into uh, the wildlife management support team and we can process that to you separate to your seed order. So just some important information um, for, for ducks to be harvested uh, across your property. So you, you need to hold a native game bird management own occupier license with the yearly property duck allocation. That's the first requirement. The second requirement is that you must only allow licensed hunters onto your property con to control those ducks. And so if you do want to control the ducks yourself, again, you need to have passed the waterfowl identification test and also hold a game hunting license. And both of those things um, we, can, we can run for you. Uh, you don't have to pay for the, the, the duck ID test and you don't have to pay for a game hunting license. For those of you that haven't got their duck ID done, uh, we can do that online. So uh, you just have to flick me an email or, or get, get in touch with me and, and we can organize that. So again, just growers are encouraged to use a, a, a combination of non-lethal control methods such as your automatic scare guns, lights, flashlights, or in combinations in addition to licensed hunters for effective management of ducks across your rice crop. So how do EPI assesses your yearly property duck allocations? So uh, basically you, you would apply for the ducks that you want. And then what I would do is I, I just do a background check or historical check uh, from previous years uh, to see what was previously allocated and what was previously harvested across your property. So that's why it's really important for hunters to submit their harvest returns. 
each time they, they harvest ducks on your properties. And so it is a requirement that they supply a harvest return within 14 days of those ducks being taken. And it plays a really important role because when I assess your requested allocations each year and I do my background assessment, it's, it's really good or it makes it easier for me to see that, okay, we've allocated these ducks in the past. They have been a, a problem, have been a nuisance. They have been harvested because the hunters are reporting. And it's a lot easier for me to, I guess, approve that uh, relatively quickly rather than sort of escalating things to, to higher approval. So just really important that if hunters are on your property and they are harvesting ducks, that they do do their harvest return. So if you need licensed hunters to assist you, uh, again, we, we have both the hunter register available and the and the landholder register. So for those of you that don't know, the landholder register is where you can nominate to go onto a list. Um, and that's been, that's provided to licensed hunters only and they can initiate contact with you and you can organize or facilitate them onto your properties. Uh, likewise, uh, the hunter register uh, is where hunters will actually nominate the regions that they're available to hunt in or their preferred regions and when they're available and you've got the opportunity to access that list and initiate contact with the hunter as well. So both those things are in play uh, again this year with the landholder register. Once you do, you come in through the seed order form and we'll send you out your, your, your license, your yearly license and, and paperwork. It'll, it'll come with the landholder register form. So you just have to fill that in and email that back to us and we can add you on the list. So just a bit of a reminder, we, we do have uh, what's called the landholder portal, which, which is really uh, for those that hold an unoccupied license through the program. And, and you can basically at any time log on to this portal and view your property information in terms of the, the ducks that are allocated to your property, uh, the species, um, the, the remaining uh, figures. And to, to do that, you just need your license number and your security pin. And both those things are sent to you each year with your paperwork. Uh, if you do happen to lose your paperwork and you're not sure what that number is, um, by all means, you can get in contact, uh, send us an email, or give us a call and we can provide that information to you over the phone. So uh, yeah, just a bit of a reminder that that option, that avenue is there for, for growers to log on and, and view that information at any time. Well, I think uh, the next slide's not changing for me. But here we go. So just a quick one on the Victorian New South Wales border closure. So uh, we have two, two and a half thousand licensed duck hunters uh, for the program. Now 80% of them actually reside in Victoria and quite a few of them reside in metropolitan Melbourne. So you know, there could be the situation when you start planting rice next month or over the next couple of months that your regular hunters might not be able to come across the border. So the best advice I really have there is, is to, to, to contact Service New South Wales and, and find out the latest information. I mean, the information changing uh, weekly, so it's really hard to know, uh, you know, if what the circumstances are this week, if that's going to change next week or, or the, or you know, a month later. So to get the latest information, you know, I would be going to Service New South Wales. And from what I understand, there is an option there for you to uh, potentially register uh, hunters uh, as, uh, for their critical service permit uh, and a cross-border permit that come across, but you'll, you'll have to basically employ them, but not necessarily uh, pay them and the other thing there is, is it only applies to those that reside within 100 kilometres south of the Victorian border. So it doesn't capture the Melbourne based hunters who are in the stage four lockdown. So until they get out of that, you know, it, it's, it's unlikely that they're going to be able to, to cross the border. But there is potentially the option for you to uh, get some Victorian hunters who live within 100 kilometres of that border. And there's lots of hunters that reside in in Wodonga and in Echuca and in Shepparton and so forth. So best, best, best bet there is to, again, contact Service New South Wales for the most up-to-date information. 
We'll go to the next slide, please. Cool, so I just wanted to quickly touch on some of the research that we're doing uh, on uh, duck movements across uh, Australia. And so we were fortunate enough to get a 19 satellite transmitters uh, last November on a variety of species, so black duck, wood duck, and gray teal. And we're finally starting to get some good information coming from them and, and the researchers have still uh, got a, quite a fair bit to do in terms of analyzing that data. But uh, what it's showing is that there's a proportion of the duck population that are sedentary and are, I guess, local birds that are staying locally within the Riverina. But there's also a portion of the birds that are classed as nomadic. And so what that means is they're actually moving um, extreme distances outside of their capture location and it's generally greater than 400 kilometres. So just a couple of really quick uh, case studies. I'll just go to the, if we can go to the next slide. So there's a, so for instance, uh, one of the grey teal uh, actually moves close to 2,000 kilometres between points uh, in a relatively short period of time and, and had a home range of 98,700 square kilometres quite different to a lot of the other ducks that stayed within the local area. So again, this duck was classed as nomadic. If we go to the next slide, we'll see another grey teal as well that uh, moves quite a large, a large distance as well. Just, we can go to the next slide, please. Oh, okay, so this was a strain wood duck, uh, which traveled close to a thousand kilometers between points and a, and a home range of 583.7 square kilometers. So, you know, some really interesting information to show that, again, a proportion of the population of ducks aren't just residing within the Riverina, they are traveling outside that area, they, going, they are going into state. And the other information that we're getting from the satellite trackers is, is we're starting to get a good picture of their survival rates as well. And we are getting, down in Victoria, some of the ducks uh, that were harvested in their recreational duck season down near Barnsdale actually had a satellite tracker on them. It cost about $6,000 that, uh, that tracker. So uh, fortunately we were able to uh, retain it. But uh, it shows that uh, the ducks are moving quite a, quite a long distance throughout Australia. So yeah, just in summary, I, I guess just the key messages is to uh, plan ahead this year for ducks, especially if you're growing rice. I think at some stage, if you do grow rice, ducks are gonna be an issue. So prepare your equipment, your non-lethal control equipment, service your, your lights and your sirens and your gas guns, make sure they're all operating. Start to have those conversations with, with your local hunters. If they're in Melbourne, you know, it, it might be that they might not be able to come across this year. So start to look at alternatives um, and, you know, potentially even contacting some New South Wales hunters or, or going onto the landholder register or using the hunter register as well. And I guess, yeah, make, make sure you, you use a combination. I know most of you do, but the non-lethal control methods along with hunters is probably the best way to effectively control ducks on your rice crops. So that's it from me. I'm happy to take uh, any questions if there are any. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I can't see any questions at the minute. Cool. So thank you very much for joining us. And if anyone's got questions over the season, they can contact Patrick. So just finally, um, Russell Ford is just going to quickly chat about some work he's doing with AgriFutures Australia. Thanks, Charlie. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep, all good. All good. Um, thank you. Yeah, this is just a bit of an update in the research and development and extension area. AgriFutures Australia has commenced a scoping study uh, to identify opportunities for transformational change in water productivity in the rice industry. Um, we're really seeking feedback from growers, agronomists. We're already re going out to the researchers, not just in Australia, but across the world, um, looking for ideas where we might drive efficiencies, uh, where we can actually speed up the rate of development in change. And the idea is to 
lift our water productivity up to that target of 1.5 tonnes per megalitre. And that's the challenge for us. We're, we're not just looking at agronomy, we're not just looking at breeding, we're looking at all facets. We're actually looking a lot into technologies, but we know growers come up with many of the good ideas and um, we really respect anybody who can feed us information on any concepts that they think that may help make this transformational change. So my number uh, and email is there. Please contact us if you want to. There's just a slide a bit down, but yeah, just contact us if you feel like you have something that might make that change. Really appreciate your feedback. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks very much, Russell. Um, please, everybody, take down his contact details because the scoping study is going to be a very big investment into the future for the rice industry. All right, so lastly, just before we finish today, we just have a quick poll um, for everyone to do so we can capture the information that everybody has learnt. Hopefully, you should now be able to see it on your screen. So I would ask if you could just quickly fill that in. That would be great, thank you. Um, there's just five questions and the poll just provides feedback for the rice extension team. So if everyone could start filling that in, that would be great. While everybody's just filling that in, a few things that is upcoming for rice extension over the next couple of months or the growing season is we are going to be reintroducing some grower groups. So face-to-face -face meetings, um, they will be happening across both uh, sides of the Murray Valley. We are also going to be introducing um, Ask an Expert. So key people in the rice industry ha who have expertise in specific areas will be available for people who have questions to ask them. We are also going to be putting a contractor database on our website. So if you are a contractor or you do provide any services, please reach out to the RAS Extension team and we can put your details on our websites or any new growers, there will be the availability for you guys to search on our website. Um, also RAS Extension have a monthly newsletter. If you're not currently subscribed, please go to our website and hit the subscribe button and Please follow us on Twitter. Um, our handle is at Rice Extension. It's where we put up nearly all our resources and information from any of our meetings. So just while people are finishing filling in the poll, we've still got about 10 people who need to answer. Just going to give a quick recap of today's meeting. So key things that we've learned is timeliness is critical for rice establishment. Um, also that you do need to touch base with your agronomist and make sure that they have enough chemical supply on hand with you. Your agronomist as a grower is your first and main point of contact. If they then need to contact rice extension after that, that's where you get it from. Also at this time of year, we encourage everybody, if you haven't done your paddock prep, please go out and do it now. Ideally, it should already be done. And finally, just make sure that you are using agronomists, advisors, and the resources like the weed ID booklet, the rice crop protection guide, and the growing guide that is available. They are some really important tools and provide a lot of information for the upcoming rice season. So please, if you take nothing else away, just go and download those resources. Um, Mark Groats just made a comment that he would encourage everybody to reach out to Russell Ford with any ideas you've got about the future of the rice industry. They are looking for blue sky ideas on you know, advancing the technology and making it more profitable and better production. So thanks to everybody. Um, I'll just close off. I know there's still a few people answering the questions on the poll. So if you could please just finish that, I might wait another minute. Um, the idea of the poll is so that RAS Extension can collect feedback from today just to make sure we're delivering the most up-to-date information to everybody. So thank you to everybody who has been able to join us today.
it's not ideal that we, um, you know, are online, which doesn't suit some people, but it is great that we've had over 40 people join us today. So just finally, before I jump off and leave you all, I just want to make everyone aware that today is Are You OK Day. So please reach out, talk to your mates, talk to everybody in your life to make sure they are OK. And if they're not, that is fine. But if everybody could just, you know, talk to everyone who's in their lives and provide that uh, network of people and somewhere for them to feel safe. So thanks to everybody who's joined our pre-season meeting this morning. And we do hope to see you later in season C21. Thanks, everybody. That's it for today. Thanks, Charlie. Catch up with everybody.